is um, a Howard Street, also known as Joy Lane subdivision. It had been on the books probably six months or, or more ago, and it's come back up. Mm -hmm. Feedback. So, so we'd like to get that uh, subdivision form H and form K, is it, or M? Okay. Approved K. Yeah. So, Andrew, can you bring that up so that? Yep. Um, so we have Steve Knight here with us as well, who is current owner and looking to develop the six lot subdivision that the CPDC approved off of Howard Street. It is now, it's proposed to be called Joy Lane. The engineering department completed a bond estimate, which included utility work, drainage design, uh, landscaping features such as street trees, and as well as the roadway work that would need to be done. Um, they finalized that mid-January, and then the owner was able to uh, get the covenant agreement form H and the tri-party agreement form K into us today, um, looking for the CPDC to endorse. So. The engineering bond estimate came in at 290,000 and that's what is listed here on the form K as well. Okay. Obviously we haven't had time to read through any of this. And the three parties listed are that I believe is typically the owner, the bank, and us. CPDC. Um, CPDC. Okay. So do we have a motion to approve form K that's in front of us now? Sure, do we take in two separate motions or can I do it as one motion? Julie, that's a- Do it as one. Um, are, are there any well first i would just ask are there any questions from cpdc or from the public about what these documents are and why you have to do them and no nope, it's pretty straightforward from my perspective okay so i'll move to endorse forms h and k for it's Howard, it's Howard Street, which is for, for Howard's for for the for 135, 139, 149 R Howard Street. Okay, can we have a roll call vote? Am I? Um, do we need a second? Oh, we do need a second. Before I second, yep. Has the town approved the name Joy Lane? Sure not. Yes, That's a question that. for Steve. I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar sorry, with, with okay. Zoom. I don't even know if I'm on the screen, but I think I just hit unmute. Can yes, everybody we can hear, hear you. me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I did. Um, I sent the request in to Ryan Percival, um, and he had he checked with the fire department, um, like for for nine one one reasons, and he said everything was everything was okay with Joy Lane. There was nothing that's similar to it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, do we have a second on this motion? Second the motion. Excellent. And can we now vote? Aye, says Pam. Tony, aye. Heather, aye. Nick, aye. yes. Okay. Oh, Katerina here. Katerina, uh, you're muted. Uh, uh, yes, sorry, I went at the same time as Nick. And John I'm gonna just- abstain. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. abstain. Okay, so that is approved, that can go through. Good. Okay, next order of business is Shoot Street 40R Plan Review. Hello, Josh. Good evening. So thank you for having us tonight again on Zoom. Um, but good evening, I'm Josh Latham here on behalf of Plinsall Companies. Uh, we're the applicant to redevelop the property at 45 High Street 
in 6-16 Shute Street as a mixed use project under the town's downtown smart growth district in Chapter 4ER. We last appeared before you on December 13th. Uh, the public hearing on this application originally opened on August 9th of last year, and this is the fifth continued public hearing. With me this evening are Jeffrey Olinger, the project architect, Patrick McCarty, the civil engineer, and Jamie Garrity on behalf of the applicant. At the last hearing, uh, we received a lot of feedback from the CPDC members and from the public. We've revised the project design to address those comments, and we look forward to presenting these updates tonight. With that, I'd like to turn over to Jeff Bollinger to address, uh, address these changes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, and Andrew, if you wouldn't mind sharing it to this one, to the Jeffrey Olinger, not the OA. Should be able to now. All right. Great. Okay. So again, I want to thank Josh for the introduction. Um, again, uh, this is our fifth presentation and we have uh, digested quite a few of the comments. Um, we'll start with a design update as well as, an, and we'll follow that with an abutter update. And that'll be followed by um, any remaining questions uh, for the team. So our first comment, uh, that we're responding to was the move of the transformer, um, which was done fairly easily. Uh, we've moved that to Shoot Street um, and we're working with RMLD um, to confirm that it's uh, acceptable, um, but we believe that the Shoot Street location is superior and will allow for um, the High Street Plaza to now be fully dedicated to the retail. Um, we have for comment two, um, a better, and more articulate explanation of the open space and what we're contributing to the streetscape. And you'll see that in a, another slide where we've now provided 558 square feet of open plaza <clears throat> as well. And in order to do that, um, we've expanded the corner plaza um, to uh, allow for a, a partially covered area um, as well as a more usable uh, public uh, area. We've also, redesigned uh, the uh, High Street Plaza, so now it can be dedicated entirely to retail too. Um, and we've also retained some of the function of the existing uh, 355 uh, square foot plaza so that um, it can still act as an active uh, plaza for the town um, as they would need. The uh, third comment that we're responding to um, is that the building feels too big that the building feels too um, large. And for that, uh, we'll take you through our design changes where we've updated the cornice so that now um, the building conforms to the height requirements. Um, we've also adjusted the fourth floor of the building so that it adopts more of a, a residential mansard language. And we've also introduced a third floor cornice line, um, which we think visually lowers the building. We've also, uh, created an infill material um, at the big green wall or where a lot of people were responding to the amount of copper patina that was present. Um, but you'll see that we've also improved some of the detailing around the windows as well. And we've also added balconies to the commercial portion of the um, building uh, to help increase the amount of human scaled elements um, that are present on that facade. And our goal there again is to emphasize as much uh, human activity and life across the building as possible um, as a way to help uh, reduce the scale and the massing of the building in general. Um, and then we also uh, have studied the shadow impacts of our building um, towards uh, the abutters, and we're happy to provide an update uh, for that as well. Excellent. Okay, so for our first comment, this one was fairly straightforward. Um, our uh, parking layout um, actually had a wedge-like space that was at the northeast corner of the building um, or the property, and that allowed us to move the transformer um, to that location. And we can even build a pad underneath that that would help to raise it um, up to the level of the sidewalk um, in that area. It'll also be located behind a fence, and so that will also visually screen it from the street 
we think this is a great location uh, for the transformer and it now really allows us um, to activate all of that 203 square foot uh, terrace that's off of our second retail space. For our second comment, um, we hope that this diagram clearly illustrates where the two uh, ground floor spaces are. Um, we have a 203 square foot space uh, that is at the northwest uh, portion of our property off of our second retail space, uh, which we've already described. And then we have an expanded uh, corner park um, that now has a concave uh, portion that has carved out uh, the retail. Um, at the second level, you'll see that we've retained um, that, uh, that rounded nose um, so that we now have a canopy that will shelter portion of that park. Here we have more detail for our 203 square foot terrace off of retail two. And you can see in the lower left-hand corner of the slide, we've shown four um, seats, or uh, eight seats, uh, four cafe tables. So with that, we believe that you can use that both for dining purposes, or if that was being used for some other function um, for some sort of indoor outdoor retail, and or it's also just nice to have a larger, more generous sidewalk there, um, particularly since we're proposing a street tree. Um, so that will also help to create a nicer place uh, beneath that tree. The Reading Depot Park, um, we've adopted many of the comments that we heard in the previous uh, presentation. And here you can see how, uh, in fact, curving it the opposite way to create a concave and a convex kind of uh, design uh, maneuver. Um, the concave portion now at the ground uh, allows for an expanded park. And so now it has added another uh, third to that park. Um, so it's significantly larger. Um, we also have a, a sheltered area. We're open to the idea, as you can see here, to having operable portions of that wall. So let's say in some future use that wanted to be used for um, some sort of walk-up service, uh, takeaway service, or ice cream, um, what, you know, whatever people may want to serve out of that window. Um, that could be something that could be activated and allow for the park to be used even if the weather wasn't so good, people would still walk up and potentially get a cup of coffee or so. Um, and we've also been able to expand the most meaningful portion of the park, um, which gives us uh, more seating and uh, helps us to keep it as, as, as a vibrant part of the downtown. Here you can see another view of uh, what that park would look like. This is, uh, rendered into the butter view that was provided to our team. And you can get a sense for on the ground, you can see, and you can obviously look at this uh, after the meeting in more detail, um, but you can see how uh, that maneuver has allowed us to uh, create a more generous park. And something that our team has been discussing, and we think it's obviously a, a great point of dialogue to continue with the, with the town, but we've even discussed providing an, a public easement uh, to a portion of this park um, with the idea that uh, this could become a permanent part of the town's uh, streetscape. And if there was a, you know, a higher, better use that the town wants to put it to, we are more than willing to um, help uh, achieve that. Our third comment was that the building feels too big. Um, and so to that end, um, we have reduced the cornice height. So now that's significantly lower and we no longer will need a height waiver. Um, we've introduced a fourth floor mansard element, um, which you'll see in the elevation. Um, the third floor cornice line, as I mentioned, is also will be visible in that elevation. Um, balconies, infill material, and we've also eased the north um, east corner of the building so that it is more generous to its abutter. So here on the top, you can see our previous design, which has an almost solid commercial side of the building, if you want to call it that, a solid green. Um, you can see here that we've introduced that infill material and picture frame the massing 
we think that helps to make that entire reading of the building more delicate. Um, the, at, you can see that the glass pier that we had shown uh, along this uh, streetscape, which maybe my mouse will show it here, um, that's been replaced by a series of open air balconies that can be walk out. And we think that adding the railing, adding these other features helps for someone to look up at the building and visually identify how a person might inhabit it which is a little bit different than having a more minimal kind of glassy type of corner, which may be beautiful. However, it may not speak exactly to what type of a, what the character of that building is. And in this case, we wanted to read as though it's very residential. Um, if you look to the right side of the building, you'll see also that we've replaced the fourth floor with a mansard roof. And that mansard roof has the top of it eased, um, as well as we've also lowered the parapet slightly. Um, and that helps the building in general to soften as it's meeting the sky, and then also helps it to blend better with the residential of butter um, as that uh, transitions into the adjacent zone. You'll also see here, um, it's kind of a smaller detail, but it's meaningful in the rendering you'll see in the next slide. Um, that changing, we, we've uh, chamfered the, the fourth floor corner so that there's a secondary massing break at that um, north facade, which we think also helps the building to feel as though it's been reduced in scale, um, which then also allows it to emphasize our third floor um, cornice line, which again is another architectural element that we've introduced to help lower the eye and, hope, and lower the general feel of the building. And here you can see a before and after view of um, the shoot street, shoot street facade, um, but it's consistent across the building. And on the upper portion, you'll see the significantly larger parapet, um, where now we've reduced that in height. It's particularly present also on the end view, which we have a little bit later. Um, you can see the, art, the new articulation to our fourth floor, which we believe softens it. You can also see how the northeast corner of the building being rotated off really does now feel as though it's been set back another five or six feet at, at that corner. And then the balconies themselves, I've introduced a zone of transparent picket, which helps light to pass through um, those balconies and visually lighten them. And it's, it's, it's quite nice actually to see how that allows light to slip through and onto the building. Here you can see what our previous view uh, from the train station is. And this has the larger cornice and the glass piers. And then here you can see the new which has the lower cornice line. We've still architecturally broken up the face of it with the balconies and created some detail at the top of those um, piers, but everything now is obviously more functional, um, can be used as, a, as an outdoor balcony. So now actually 100% of the units have balconies, which is great. Um, and then we've also introduced this infill material, which will be consistent uh, from the uh, other portion of the residential building. We think that too helps to um, break up that larger monolithic reading, make it feel more delicate, begins to help the whole composition feel more human scaled. Here's the view from High Street, which we saw a portion of this previously. This is relatively unchanged, except for, again, we've uh, continued the mansard language um, around this side of the building. We think that that material change also emphasizes it, a feature of the design guideline in terms of adjusting material as you go up the face of the building. And then here is the nose of the building. We've, we've retained uh, one glass pier um, at, at the end of the building, but I, I think that that's still an important aspect given that it's an arch the architecturally most significant part of the building. Um, and so I think that can have an elevated uh, aesthetic to it, if possible. 
Um, but you can also see how much more open the ground floor is um, with the way that we've adjusted that, but we still have a lot of glazing that's present and looks out onto the, um, out onto the park. So that should actually be, you know, lit in the, in, in the late part of the year when, you know, the sun doesn't come up until nine in the morning and sets at four in the afternoon. Um, so we'll have hopefully a year round park space that is well lit, well maintained and comfortable for everyone to use. Here again is a detail of what that corner park looks like. Again, we've left it open and we're obviously very open to any dialogue that the town wants to have about, about how that's used or programmed. Here at the street, we've large, we've retained the high street um, uh, storefront um, basically as it was, <clears throat> made some minor adjustments um, at the second level uh, where we could introduce either more signage or as simply, you know, the back panel of what are otherwise planters. Okay, sorry, and then uh, we're happy to answer any questions uh, relative to this one. Um, next is the uh, the shadow study. Um, so we've dug in pretty deep on the due diligence for this. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're not creating an issue. And what we found is that our building, because it has a, a fortuitous um, orientation, um, as well as uh, being, set lower because of the grade allows us to calculate that we only impact, um, this is the abutter at 100 Wolburn that um, uh, approached us in the last meeting, um, that we only really impact him at the longest day of the year and in the early morning hours. We've provided an updated um, shadow study for review. And in this one, we've been able to isolate which portion of the shadow is generated by our building. And that's been made black in this uh, example. Um, and then we've shown the existing shadow in a lighter gray. And we've also done some animations as well that you know obviously we'd be happy to share at some point. Um, but what we've sort of gleaned from this is that out of these nine sample times, uh, which are 9 a.m., noon, and then 5 p.m. consistently across the year, that our building really only throws shadow onto 100 Woburn's property um, for two of those nine um, frames. And the two times of year that it does would be at the equinox and it doesn't quite reach the roof of the building. It's actually in the yard that it's throwing shadow. And then the longest or the shortest day of the year at the winter solstice, um, we throw shadow at 9 a.m. onto his building. But as we've seen in our animations, the shadow actually accelerates very quickly off of his property. And that's largely because the building is effectively a point that's, that's pointing north at that northeast corner. Um, so I should honestly not call it the northeast corner and just call it the north corner. And what you can see in the other seven of these nine images is that our building is either showing throwing shadow onto itself or it's projecting it um, onto Shoot Street, um, which is where the majority of all of our shadow would fall. And from here, I can take us through a, a plan update um, just so we can update you on the other areas of the building that we've adjusted, although it's been relatively minor with the exception of the things that we've already addressed. Um, so here we can see an updated sidewalk plan that shows how we've carved out um, the park. Uh, I can show this in greater detail at the first floor plan. Um, here, you can see in the bottom uh, of the slide where we have still indicated the arc of where the previous building was extending to in the plan. And you can see how we've carved it back this is in the new. Hey. 
I think you went mute, Jeff. Oh, hey. All right. Where oh, it went back on. I keep getting muted. Let me make sure I don't get muted. Um, all right, I'm still there, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, you left off after mentioning the changes at the terrace. Yes. So, um, okay. So, you can see that we have uh, retained what it, what effectively is the overhead shelter of the second floor, but carved down, carved back the gra the ground floor um, to expand it uh, almost almost 50 percent in total for the for the um for the terrace the parking garage is still basically the same with the exception that we've moved the transformer to a pad that will be accessed off of shoot street and the organization of the trash the stair fire all those things are the same Here at the second level, you'll see that it's basically unchanged other than the new amenity spaces that were added um, in the previous presentation. The third floor is essentially unchanged. And again, the I guess and this also goes for, for the second floor um, that we have balcony space now where we previously had glass piers. And here at the fourth floor, you can see how we've eased the um, northeast corner of the building and chamfered that, but it still enabled us to achieve a 925 square foot two bed um, with two exposures, which is nice. Here again is an updated uh, material palette, which is basically unchanged um, and the updated rendering on the right hand side now showing uh, the balconies which would be trimmed out in a similar type of uh, bronze panel. And that is it. So we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, let's open it up to questions from the board and the board only if we could. Confused a little bit about the shadow study. You're, you're saying that the the gray shadow, which is the existing one-story building that's set across the parking lot, is casting a longer shadow than your building. No, no, no. I'm saying that current. Well, currently, it probably doesn't cast any shadow. It doesn't make it to that property line. So then, what's the gray? And when you look at that shadow plan, those were well. There's a there's a fence. Actually, that's what it is. There's an existing fence. So you'll see here, this is actually a shadow line that the fence generates into the backyard. So I gather that even currently throughout the year, um, currently this time of the year, especially, that that fence probably puts a good amount of shadow across that entire backyard. Wasn't their complaint more about the roof and uh, solar panels? Right. Yes. So this this doesn't actually, <clears throat> except for, again, long, shortest day of the year um, is the only time it gets a little bit onto theirs. Uh, Other than that, their, their roof is unaffected by our building. Do you mind if I jump in on a clarification where um, I actually thought it was 98 Woburn, where the the one on the corner where the fellow was talking to us because that 100 Woburn, the one in the middle, that's the one that's been put up for sale and sold. I just, it, it maybe a check, I know, I just went back through my notes, but I, I thought it was the one on the corner. I'm not sure it makes a huge difference, but maybe we can check and make sure we're talking about the right property. We can that definitely make sure. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, Jamie, I, I believe it's 100 Wilburn, right? Actually, if, if I could clarify, so um, 98 Wilburn Street was, I believe, the one put up for sale, and Mr. Gagne spoke last time. He was the buyer of that property, and that was his first time appearing after having purchased the property. 
so it was uh, his property that he was put trying to put solar panels on. He said something about Tesla, which I wasn't sure of. That's correct. So he, he purchased the property um, a few months ago, and his comment last time, not to put words in his mouth, was essentially that he had concerns about the ability to put solar panels on his roof. Okay. And, and that's why we went into this deep dive to ensure that we wouldn't have that impact. But Josh, yeah, excuse definitely. me, just to clarify, it was 100 Woburn, not 98 Woburn. Okay, sorry to jump in there. No, that's fine. No, no, it's fine. Jump away. Anybody else on the board have a question or a comment? Not about shadows. Not about shadows. Uh, any of the improvements that they've made? Bit of nip and tuck here and there. I'm not going to characterize them all as improvements, but the changes. Hmm. Yeah, I really don't like that Mansard. It's like this half effort. I hate Mansard roofs anyways, but you know, the ones over at Arc are, are nice because they're real Mansards. These are just like this little gesture that reminiscent of the old, uh, I don't know, crappy 7-Eleven stuff. I would have preferred to see the, your new uh, projecting profile cornice along those edges. I think it would have been just as well, but that's just my opinion. Um, I, I think the biggest thing that's sticking out right now is that you, you've character, you've took away from the meeting, you've characterized it as the building is too big. When my final question was defend how many units you're putting in here, not the building's too big because the massing is well sculpted. Um, and uh, I think Josh, you said this is the fifth meeting. It was the first meeting when I said there's too many units. So that's where I am right now still. Defend how many units you're putting in there. Okay. Um, so, as we know, uh, the development of the building um, has a certain level of economic performance that it needs to achieve in order to also balance um, the affordability goals for the project. And what we found is that the number of units that we've developed for this project helps us to both fit the massing of the building with a number of units that will be at the right size primarily for um, the market, but then also helps us to provide a high enough density that we can achieve the affordable um, housing goals of the town. If, if I could add on to that, you know, I, I think it kind of goes to a philosophy, a philosophical question. And 40R in the downtown smart growth district are intended to set, to find those appropriate spaces where density makes sense. You know, I would argue that really, if you look at all the 40Rs that have been approved in the downtown, this is probably the most ideal location for one. And we're right across from the transit. It provides affordable housing units. It provides this, this symbiotic relationship between commercial and residential use. It's a well-designed building. It's a great re-improvement of an existing tired site. You know, this is the exact purpose of 4ER. And we're not asking for any waivers that are extreme or beyond what has been approved for these other projects. Now, I do understand that, that certainly whenever there's, there's change within the town, there's going to be opposition and there's going to be uncomfortable growth and uncomfortable feelings about it. At the same time, though, I think this is probably the most ideal location for what it is that we're proposing. Um, I don't think that anything here, you know, from a massing perspective, as, as Nick said, I, I think it is actually very well sculpted. We meet all setback requirements. We really are very appropriate about the transition to the residential zone. Um, this is a very unique spot. It's a, it's a gateway location because it's as trains are coming in, as cars are coming down the street, it really is this very important spot. And I think Jeff has done a great job of designing a building that fits very well here. It's not just the usual kind of downtown Reading design. I think it takes some of that, but it really builds on it. It's something that the town be proud of. And the density is part of that. 
you know, we meet the height requirements, we meet all those setbacks. There's beautiful, I think, design elements to this that to accomplish that, we do have to have a certain unit count. And to have eight affordable units, that's part of that equation. You know, if, if you look at this and you say, okay, you have to do uh, 20 units per acre, I'm not sure you're going to find a single property in the downtown that can do that and provide affordable housing. You, you truly have to provide almost three quarters of an acre of spot to get affordable housing under that minimum standard. And what we're proposing is really it falls squarely within what has already been approved. I do understand that zoning is undergoing changes and that density is a part of that discussion. But at the same time, where density makes sense, it should be approved. We'd rather see it in the downtown than we would on the outskirts within the rural areas. The town selected this area specifically to allow smart growth, more, more reliance on public transit, less car travel, walking within the downtown, livable community. This project checks all the boxes. And, and I think the developer and, and, and Jeff in particular has done a great job of designing something that I think would really fit very well here. And, and again, there's nothing that's beyond what has already been approved. In fact, I think this is probably one of the more beautiful projects um, that has been approved in the density that we're proposing. So that's, uh, I'll get off my philosophical part of it, but that's, that's my attempt to defend really where the density comes from. We appreciate your input. Any other members of the board? John, Nick, Heather, Katrina, comments? Um, I have some questions and comments and you might, <laughs> I too am still kind of with, by the way, you've, you've done a lot of work with us. I should say, you know, I, I, I do appreciate how you took, um, many of our comments and questions and suggestions and worked with them. Um, I'm, I'm also still questioning how many units are really necessary here, but I don't need you to repeat what you've just said. Um, I I do have a question. I'm not really understanding actually what, what the materials are in the areas where you've broken up the the green copper patina. Question about that. I also, um, this is, it's kind of just a little thing, but I am curious. I noticed that you changed the design so that on the top of the, um, top of the first floor at the basically at the railing of the second story where before you talked about how great it was to have all of that vegetation showing um, there are now little mini uh, kind of that they're not walls but now you've got that area you blocked I'm curious about the thinking about that um, yep so uh, the, the first question on the infill material um, we're trying to remain open-minded about it. And it's primarily that it could be a terracotta material. It could be um, a brick material. Um, so there's a range of materials that it could, could be. It won't likely be fiber cement. Um, and so I, I think that we want to keep, keep it open, but we want to get something that has a natural um, uh, through color um, such as a terracotta or, or, or something like a thin brick or even a full brick. All right. So we haven't seen these materials yet, have we? Not yet. Those will likely be presented in um, a, a pre-construction uh, review. Okay, and the thinking behind kind of closing off the the, the view yeah, to the that, plants that on that was, second um, level. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that was uh, sort of twofold. One was um, there was a concern that unless those are really well maintained, and obviously they would like to be, but like let's say for some reason they didn't end up being perfect, they could kind of ruin like otherwise a very nice you know stretch of building um so kind of one missing tooth might ruin the whole smile kind of thing um and then there was also an idea that if if they're 
did want to be, uh, you know, as I mentioned, potentially signage, but th again, that may be, you know, not the right place for it. It might want to be a little bit lower, but it was sort of to clean up the idea of the planter, but still allow for the ability for some transparency to be there, both, you know, kind of at the pier. And then also vegetation would still be able to grow through the um, railing, um, but it would simply not show any of the back of house if the back of house wasn't perfectly cleaned up or there was, you know, kitty toys or something like that out there. Okay. Overall, I'm, lo I'm looking at this and, you know, I'm not an architect, but I, I feel like there is still just like a, a lot going on with this building. And so I, you, you've broken it up and I, you know, that's probably helpful. Um, there's, there's a, there's a lot going on. Nick, John, any comments, questions? I'm still trying to find the uh, waiver for density here, actually, because it's not on any of the documents. I'm running through the decision here. Because what we got was a narrative. That's great. You got the narrative about why this is a great location and why you want to put in these units. But that doesn't defend how many units. Last time you made a statement that less than this many units, the project is dead. So that's the defense. Show me that. How do you know that? How do I know that two less units kills a project? Going from I don't. What's the density we're, waiver we're asking for here? Sixty-four percent more. Sixty-three. Oh, sorry, sixty-three units per acre. Why isn't that on the cover sheet? Why do I have to dig for this, Julie? What's the number? I think it was at seventy-five last I last I checked. Okay, Josh. So you want density, right? How do I know this doesn't work at 65? Right? Prove that to me. And not by using words, because the words make sense. This is the perfect location for this project. Right? We did approve downtown smart growth for, for density in the downtown. We want the mixed use. Okay, the other projects, some of them were seed projects. We needed to get things started. And now we're starting to accumulate projects and so we can be more particular about it. If, if I can answer. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess the question is what it exactly is it that the commission would want to see in, in regards to that, that point? Because ultimately one part of the statute is that projects are treated consistently and that there's an expectation as to how they will be reviewed and approved. And so if other projects haven't presented any other type of information, I, I guess it, it's hard for me to say, what would we present? I guess what I could also say is that from an affordables perspective, to provide the affordables obviously requires a certain level of market rate units. And at 31 units, that allows us to provide eight affordable units. And if we drop it by two, that will result in an ensuing reduction down to seven affordable units or when we get to the next level. So there's just going to be that, that kind of constant relationship between how many market rate units to provide how many affordable units. The other part is that if other 40 hours are coming before the town, the question is going to always be if density is that overriding factor. Folks are probably going to choose to go the route of providing no affordables and building something at 12 rather than try, trying to provide affordables at a higher density. And first of all, it's hard to get the density because you can't really just can't meet 20 per acre. The other is that if they have a choice to make between, you know, providing 12 market rate without affordables or looking to provide affordable units, it's going to be the constant tension. And sometimes it just ends up being easier to go at the lower, the lower number of units without affordables. And the more that that builds up over time, the district has to provide a certain level of affordable units. This project helps the town to get those units within this district, meeting those standards. So eight affordable units, is, it's, a, it's not something to shake a stick at. I mean, that's a very important contribution in a lot of ways. And to get to eight affordables, we're talking about having to provide the 31 market rate. 
if the town is looking at saying that you know the affordables aren't quite as important, then certainly it's one of those things we can always adjust on market rate at the same time. But if there's any other direction as to what exactly you want us to submit, certainly it's something that we can evaluate and try to decide how we can do that. Um, I'm not a financials guy. I'm just saying that somebody could look over the pro formas or some other proposal and understand where that line is. So you're telling me, you know, there's a ratio of 31 to 8 for this particular building. Um, but I don't know how, how you come up to with that number. That's all. And just to add, obviously, every property is somewhat different and every construction and design is somewhat different. And as you evaluate a better design, a more beautiful building, better materials, it, it, it's obviously a higher cost. And you, you know that, Nick. I'm... I'm telling you something you're very familiar with, but for this project, that's that's essentially the analysis. If there's, again, if there's something specific, I know the town probably doesn't want us submitting or any applicant fi finalizing and submitting financials and pro formas on projects. Um, but if there's something else that we could provide that might help with that decision, certainly we do that. So I'll chime in. I, I, I'm, it's taken me a, a little bit of a while to kind of nail down my own thinking about about the density and what that means. And um, the thing that I find challenging about it is the density that you're seeking here, and how much then of the first story must be allocated to parking. Um, most way, I, 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 okay, if I had done some more better math on the fly or in preparation, I'd be able to say what percentage is allocated to parking. But here we are, right, in, a, in an area that is across from the train station where we should be focusing on you know, easy, easy commute if you're going into Boston, easy walkability to services. However, we all know that people need, people still, we're out in a suburb, people do drive, we have cars, and at the density that you're seeking, it still, it forces so much of that street area to be allocated to parking, which is why I'd like to see it, I'd like to see it pushed a little bit so that we can reduce the needed parking that's associated with how many units you've got in there. Not, be, not to reduce the needed parking because parking isn't needed. I think parking is needed. I want to be very clear about that. But when we have that kind of density, it really forces just a tremendous portion of that first story to be allocated to a space that's only used for cars, which is actually kind of antithetical to a smart growth district, right? Can I chime in real quick? Um, so agreed, Heather, I think that you know, the more that we can reduce parking, the better. It always would be better to have more uh, retail space at the ground floor. Um, however, we should remember that the entrance to this garage is almost fixed in its location, unless we want to interrupt High Street. Um, and so we kind of are stuck with where that entrance is because of the way that the grade changes on Shoot Street. So even if we were to reduce, you know, let's say uh, if we were to try to pull out, we'd have to start pulling about six to eight spaces out before it would even have a meaningful impact on it, um, which would be a pretty radical reduction in the size of the build in the, you know, in the property, you know, um, and not to the benefit of the development and not to, the, and I'm not even talking about the developer. Um, but the idea that the that the massing would then still conform um, and that an a developer, not you know this one necessarily, could still retain that same massing, the building doesn't get any smaller. Um, and yet we have like a less useful kind of, you know, or not that much more useful of a ground floor. So even like, and it's a lot a lot of this has to do with the eccentric nature of this site, that it's a weird shape and that it has kind of an odd relationship to the terrain around it, that it really pins in the, the vehicular kind of access to it, but then also kind of limits what's available in terms of um, ground floor retail. 
um, because of that as well. So in a funny way, like the oddball shape of the site, the change in the terrain, these things are all kind of conspiring to make it like not that great of a ground floor for retail. Um, but the parts that we are able to kind of retain, um, you know, we're able to make the most of. But at no point do I think that, you know, unless this was really put to a very different use, which honestly wouldn't even benefit the other, um, you know, businesses and other people around um, that the building. Um, but if this was just to become a larger big box type use, um, it wouldn't have the same type of civic contribution that adding these additional residents would. That's another way to look at it is that our density is going to allow for more residents to be downtown Reading and be patrons of the local businesses. I, I'm not sure I have a comment in response to that. Um, I guess, you know, we've we've seen we've seen the building. I, I don't want to go back to you know what's there now and everything, but we've seen the building be, be have have businesses um, at a at a longer stretch. But I'm just saying that that's that is what is I think one of the things that's getting me about um, the really high density here. Okay. And you know, I and I I guess I also support the notion of getting um, you know some more concrete information about what's what's driving that what's driving that Rena John any comments questions I'm going to say I don't have anything different um, than comments that were already offered by the board there is one comment in the chat that says, doesn't match any other buildings. It looks out of place. Well, frankly, we're not trying to match other buildings everywhere in downtown. Otherwise, we just would have said everything has to be red brick with a you know, black mansard roof. We want architects to come in here and do something creative. We've set up some rules, and I think that those rules are good at establishing balance and patterns and, and uh, scale elements. And I think, you know, this architect in particular has always done good work in town. So I like the building. I'm just sitting here asking for some support on that number. I don't I want to see cookie cutter in. buildings all over downtown. Mm -hmm. I don't want anything to look like the building across the street. You know, everyone likes this one Haven Street building. It's great. It's, it's had its place, but that's the only one like that we should have. True. Tony, you had a question or a comment? Uh, I was going to say one of the things that um, come up is that we're seeing where decisions we've made in the past are causing issues today. Um, I'll go with Postmark. We're having problems there where people went, bought expensive condos and have found out that they don't have any place to park. Um, so, yes, we have made decisions in the past but we're learning that they may not have been the right decisions for Reading and for downtown specifically. And what we're attempting to do when we question uh, waivers on density is basically try and correct for what we've done, what we've done wrong. Well said. We should close discussion from the board and open it up to Anybody who is interested to speak? Julie, you've got full view of anybody. You see any hands raised? Yes, Barry Gagney. Yes. Hi, I think it's on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay. So I had a question. I'm the owner with my wife of 100 Uber, and of course, we brought up some questions. And I did have a question concerning what he showed in the shadow study with the light gray and the dark. Um, and some clarification, if he's saying that all the light gray is what's currently cast by 
the existing one story building and by the fence in our backyard, which is six feet below street level and 14 feet below the roof level or any surrounding structures, because I don't understand necessarily how these shadow studies come about. Um, so I'd like some clarification because if that's saying that as if we're all flat land on the other side of the fence, I could see that, but we're considerably higher than the fence in our backyard. Jeff, do you want to address that? We can see what you're displaying, but we can't hear you, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, and thank you. Also, again, for pointing out how significant the grade change is between our two properties. Um, so we know that we're about, sorry, your property is about six feet higher than ours at the property line. And we know that at least if we follow Shoot Street up to the intersection of Woburn, it's almost a 14 foot grade change. So you may very well have a 10 foot grade change between your first floor of your house and our property line, um, which would raise it another four feet. And so I think that's largely why you see um, the your backyard really only being shaded um, by our building at, you know, the early morning hours of the, um, uh, at the equinox and then in the shortest day of the year. Um, but other than that, your building is so much higher and your roof especially is so much higher um, that our building will have next to no impact on yours. I guess the question I had though is that light gray, what is that based off of for existing structures? You said it was oh, what's already yeah, those there. Are, those are your is that based off model. the elevated grade? Exactly. Yeah, those are your buildings modeled, also placed at the elevated grade. And they may not be like and, perfectly precise, but they're pretty close. And then if it's okay with the board, can I ask a secondary change and follow up question concerning the property in general? Uh, yes, you may. Um, so going back to what others have questioned about the density and what's required. Um, one thing I had sent in an email to Jamie and others was, you know, is it not possible for the building to be good for writing, good for the district and profitability if you dropped it down to three floors, got rid of the top floor, or half the top floor, you know, to fit more in line with the whole neighborhood and still retain the three to one um, that was said for profitability, still retain the 25% of affordability. You know, you have five affordable units, you know, six affordable units, depending on the size, is it not possible for the company to make the building profitable with only being three stories? Jeff, that's a question for you. My understanding is that it is not, uh, that that wouldn't work in the pro forma. And losing, losing a full story would be a third of our units. Um, so that would be a very big uh, drop. Thank you there's a lot of building there that's both, sorry, there's a lot of building that's at the ground floor. And then we have provided a lot of retail that's also present. Plus, it may not seem that way, but the high street has a really significant terrace and then has a second level of retail as well. So there, there's a fair amount of building in there in addition to the, um, the residential units. And that's, that's also should be acknowledged that that additional commercial program that's a part of the building um, is very, uh, can, is, is, is an expensive portion of the, of the property developed and also risky, economically risky. Mary Ellen was on before, is she still there? Yes, hi. Where are you from, Mary Ellen? Do you oh, if you could introduce yourself. Oh, absolutely. Mary Ellen O'Neill, 125 Summer Avenue. I just had a question about the sidewalk. 
along High Street. Um, mm -hmm. I do want to say quickly, I am disappointed that um, that you didn't give us a little more space for the public space or the you know open space there in the front. Um, I appreciate some of the other changes that you've made, but I am disappointed in that. I wanted to clarify uh, the sidewalk along High Street that there's no impingement on that sidewalk from anything that you proposed. I was a little confused by one of the, you know, images that you had shown. Oh, no, if anything, we're expanding it. So okay. you'll have significantly more sidewalk, especially at width that- Width-wise. Width-wise, yeah. And then also that High Street Plaza, the 203 square foot one is smaller and will be only for a couple cafe tables. But I think in general, the way that'll be experienced is that it'll have a significantly wider portion of the sidewalk there that'll be very pleasant. That will still be available. It looked it looked cramped for public use there in that image that you had shown. So I just wanted to double check that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Anybody else? Yeah, this is Ken Nielsen on Grand Street in Reading. Okay. Uh, I'm concerned because I looked up today and there is over a thousand apartments available in Reading and Wakefield and the surrounding area. And a lot of retail spaces are vacant. So do we really need to add more apartments to a place that's already oversaturated with empty units? It may not be profitable on the books for him to do four stories, but when it comes down to actually finding people to rent those spaces, they may not be there. Okay, I'd like to speak to the transit oriented nature of this development. Um, and we believe that this is actually gonna be a great site for people um, that want to use the commuter rail line and also want to have a walkable downtown. And that's why we really, that's why we think this is a really good location for our building. Okay, David Talbot has a hand raised. Hello, David. Everybody. Hi, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I just, I appreciated all the comments by all the members. Those were all, it's a great dialogue and I hope that you act on it too bring down the density. I just wanted to speak to the, the one thing that the wider community did ask for, which, as you know, there was a letter last time signed by 56 people from all, all different parts of the town, all different persuasions, just asking to keep the existing area at the tip, which is 680 square feet is existing now. And what this is, been, is now proposed that is 355 square feet. So I just wanted to point out it's far from what the, broad, the broader, the, the relatively modest thing that the wider community did ask for, uh, irrespective of all these other very valid concerns. Um, and, and, and lastly, I, I think that as to the shadows, um, if this casts any shadows in, in the winter mornings on a residential home that's in the residential zone, I believe that would be a precedent for a 40R development in Reading. Uh, there may have been some elsewhere, but to actually cast a shadow on a house in the residential zone, even for a couple of hours in the winter mornings would be, but I may, I may be misunderstanding that the claim is now that, or the statement now is that there is no such shadow, but if there is, it would be a precedent. Anyway, I just wanted to mainly comment about the space at the front of the building and that this does not meet what was requested by the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lawrence, your hand is raised. Hello, you thank you in? guys. Yes, hello, uh, Lawrence uh, Lowell Street in Reading. How's it going? It's good. Uh, I just had uh, one question. Has um, I haven't looked at all the things online about this, but has there been a traffic study done for this project? Jeff, do you want to address that? Sure, uh, excuse me. Um, it's Jamie Garrity speaking. Yes, there has been a study, uh, done for this project that we did. Uh, I believe discuss at a couple prior meetings, um, but we have had a full traffic study performed. All right, because uh, your interest is on Shoot Street. So there's only two ways to get to Shoot Street. It's High Street 
in Haven Street. And uh, Haven Street has the most accidents in town. Hmm. Wasn't aware of that. Well, what's that based on? I mean, throw out oh. something like that without defending it. Are, are you in, uh, in the park group or the traffic study or are you policemen in Reading? No, I just have a scanner and there's accidents on Haven Street daily. Uh, I think we'd need to uh, contact the police department to verify that. Yeah, I think you should. Okay. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Are there any other hands raised? I see Karen Ward has her hand raised. Yes, I'm Karen. I wanted to ask also about the traffic. If you did a study on that, because I live on Washington Street, and mm -hmm. certain times of the day when those train date gates go down, traffic is backed up Woburn Street in one way and uh, Woburn Street the other way up to St. Agnes Church. And do we really need any other traffic added to that? Well, if the hope is that people take the train in and out and don't drive their cars, <laughs> but we can't count that, on that. Right now with COVID going on, everybody's driving and that, that parking lot is sparse. So nice. It used this to be full. A nice job. Okay, Liz Whitelam, your hand is raised. There, uh, this is Liz Whitelam. I live on 7 Gilmore Avenue. I am also a downtown business owner. I own the bookstore. I am also a member of the park committee. I know that question just came up. Yes. So I have a few different perspectives to offer here. <laughs> um, first of all, I really wanna say thank you to uh, the architects and the people developing this project because I've been following all these meetings and I feel like they have made so many changes and they have, <laughs> I feel like every question that gets asked, they come back and they're like, okay, here's another one. So I might be offering a slightly different perspective than a lot of people dialing in today, but I was actually really impressed with what I saw today in terms of the way uh, various questions and concerns have been addressed. Um, as somebody who took a, took a long time to find commercial real estate in downtown Reading, uh, while right now it might look to people like there are empty storefronts just about everything in town that is empty right now is something that is in progress. That's just not readily apparent to the average consumer. Um, so actually I welcome additional retail space um, for some ideas that I have of some expansions in the future and some other businesses that I know would like to open but can't find appropriate locations to do so at the moment. Um, also as a business owner, I have found the 40R district to be extremely helpful in making uh, a location where we could have sustainable businesses. People claim to want a thriving, vibrant downtown. And this kind of development is so necessary to make that possible. So I'm actually just commenting that I, I like this project. I hope we can move forward with it sooner rather than later. I feel like this team has <laughs> really been through a, a lot of review and, and made a lot of changes. And I appreciate the work that's been put in. So those are my thoughts, thank you. And thank you, CPDC, for the work that you do, which is grueling and exhausting, and I couldn't appreciate you more. Thank you, Liz. Are there any other raised hands? Julie, I can see none. Yeah, yeah. Was it Matt Hesselton? Uh, yes, Matt Hesselton. Introduce hey yourself and where are you Hi, from? My name is Hi, my name is Matt Hazelton. Um, I grew up in the downtown area um, and I moved to the other side of town. I'm, I'm up off of Rustic now, uh, but my perspective is probably a little different. Um, I definitely appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this on the board and the architect and developers. Um, you know, one of the com a few of the comments that I heard kind of struck a chord with me. One of them was on uh, not matching other buildings around it. Um, and I totally get that architects kind of want to make something their own, your own unique stroke, um, stroke, brushstroke, if you will. Um, I still would like to have it have a New England feel. And I like the fact that there's an openness to maybe changing some of the facade materials. Um, I would maybe like to see what this looks like in brick. 
uh, myself, uh, so it has a New England feel. Um, design elements aside, one of the other things that came up was on expanded retail, and maybe I missed something, uh, but as a Reading resident growing up in the downtown area, you had the only laundromat in town in this building. And if this moves forward, I don't think people realize that there will be no more laundromat in town. Um, you have the last corner, which is ironically a staple of Reading. And if the last corner is effectively moved out of this building to develop things, that's just sad. <laughs> that's a Reading institution. Um, you know, and, and maybe I'm missing something, but uh, I only see two retail spaces here now, and, and there are several businesses in it currently. So did I miss something? Is the second floor also retail? So that's Correct. the first set of questions I have. Jeff, could you address that? E yes. Um, so I, I think in previous uh, presentations, we've uh, walked through the existing uh, building, its retail offering, and how um, we are compared to it. What we're looking to provide is new, high-end, beautiful, clean retail space with high ceilings and high bay if possible. We've provided two of those spaces at the ground floor. And in the last meeting, we also added a second level to the second retail space that will add an additional 440 square feet of indoor space and then access to an outdoor terrace as well. Um, that'll all be handicapped accessible space. And so we are trying to bring back a, 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 a um, high quality retail um, environment but also one that can be used flexibly across a couple of different businesses. So for example, um, I, the, the second retail space just independently is almost more interesting um, than the larger space that's at the corner. Um, and that second space I could see having a full range of different uses where I know Jamie's also, uh, if I talk too much out of turn on this one, uh, stop me. Um, but um, we've talked about flexible uh, business use for the second floor space that might even be sublet by the ground floor space. We've talked about a range of uh, fitness related things that could potentially go in there. Again, it could also be something that's more of a kitchen use because it has an outdoor dining potential for it. Um, so we see that that not only could be potentially subdivided and we could work with the town to even program that upper level retail. Um, but we think that we're going to bring back a better building than what's there right now. Agree. Thank you. Anybody else? Julie, did you have any information on the affordable housing units requirement? What about it? That was raised uh, that they said that uh, if they were to reduce the number of units that they'll fall below the acceptable number of affordable units. What is the acceptable level of affordable units? Yeah, so projects with 12 units or less are not required to have an affordable component. And that's what's in the current zoning bylaw. So there, this project is subject to the current zoning bylaw. Um, and that's a, that's a threshold that's established by the Department of Housing and Community Development. It's not established by the town. Um, I have asked if that's something that could be reduced in a future zoning bylaw amendment. I haven't heard back yet. Okay, thank you. Sure. Are there I any did, other, go ahead. Pam, I do want to correct something. Um, yes. So I did, I just looked up on the Mass DOT website um, about crashes, uh, the top this this area does not um, is not in the top five crash locations in Reading. Uh, the top five, uh, the top one, for those that are interested, by and far, is that intersection at Ash Street in Maine. Um, you know, right there in front of McDonald's and the in the Great Crossing. The other ones are uh, Salem Street in the center town, um, Forest Street in Maine, Mill Street in Maine, and Summer Street in Maine. Um, Good to know. So, which are all, I think, probably everyone in town, right? That that all makes sense, right? So, 
Excellent. I think I've seen that, crashes at every one of those places <laughs> over the years. <laughs> Some of us may have been in a crash at one of those places. <laughs> so that's that's data between um, 2010 and 2020. Good. Thank you for doing the due diligence on that. I see Sarah Bukalakia's hand raised. Sarah, do you want to weigh in on this project? Sure. Hi, hi, thank you, Sarah Brugalacchio, Maple Ridge Road, uh, Precinct 4. Um, I just have a couple of uh, comments still. Um, the first one is in regards to um, the parking, you know, being somebody who's on the park committee here. Um, is the commercial, is there any commercial parking included with this, or is this building also planning on using um, its proximity to Brandy Court parking for that? So I think our intent would be to have a um, some type of a an agreement whereby if the spaces within the garage were not fully utilized, which I think we're seeing um, from data from recently opened 40 hour projects, <clears throat> we would be willing, we would be more than willing, frankly, to allow the retail tenants to park in the garage. Um, short of that, we are adding two new parallel spaces, public spaces on High Street. Um, and then I think beyond that, we would certainly be looking to work with the committee um, to figure out a, a you know, a, I know that there are a lot of plans in the work, so I don't necessarily want to speak to specific plans, but I think we'd be willing to, you know, cooperate um, in trying to figure out something that, that might work with, with kind of a cohesive commercial um, parking arrangement. Um, and just, is this a rental project or are these condo units? Uh, it's currently slated for rental. Okay. And so I think you have 30% of your parking is compact space, correct? That's correct. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit under 30%, but that's correct. So how will you make sure that the tenants only have compact cars? Will that be part of the rental agreement or how, how is that enforced? Because that's been a problem at some other buildings. Yeah, I can speak to it. At, I know at Ace Flats um, is where uh, I have current experience with this. And the way that they've done it there is that not only have they not seen a full utilization of their garage, um, but that's enabled uh, the management company as they're signing leases up to anticipate what type of car may be coming into the garage. So um i think that those two contributing factors because jamie mentioned that there may be some additional capacity to better service uh local retail uh zip car was also thrown out there at one point as a potential alternate use for some of the parking spaces um and then yeah uh, so that's that's basically the way it's handled is that, it's dealt with that doesn't, the man, i don't the think i don't people. think you got my question what i meant is like how do how will you know that you know that you have tenants that have compact cars. How so? When you when yeah. you when you, when people have when most of your tenants don't have compact cars, then what? Then do you say when you're leasing apartments, only um, only compact cars are are, are allowed? I'm, that's what I'm wondering. Because this has been with uh, meeting with the chief of police. This has been one of the problems that they had with cars that were um, parking in lots was that they couldn't fit into their compact spot. That they were assigned. So. Yeah, so this, for my knowledge, there's kind of been two competing conversations. Um, one of them was what Tony mentioned with regards to postmark. And for that one, that's a condo related issue where you're right, the idea that the space is deeded and needs to be um, dedicated to a single unit, that's very much the case with condo buildings with an apartment building we have more flexibility because we have more transitional um tenants number one and then two it allows the management company to decouple the parking space from the unit and give them flexibility so that they can better meet the market needs of what they're seeing and then i guess third um you're right this could be a building that's entirely full of suv drivers but the reality that they're seeing in most it, it, at Ace Flats especially is that they have only three or four large oversized cars in that garage. 
and then otherwise they're sedans and many of them are actually would already qualify as a compact vehicle. Okay, so you're saying that uh, when people rent a unit, they're not uh, issued a, a parking spot. It's just sort of like a open parking. People just park wherever. Is that what you're saying? It, it may very well be at the management level, or it may simply be, okay, we know we've got 15 open spaces and we have three people coming in, two of which you know have compact cars, one has a regular size car, and then they can figure out if those how those distribute. So believe it or not, you know, it's probably a lot more like uh, seats on an airplane where they can figure out everyone's seat, but it just means that they have to shuffle around a little bit. And because it's an, it's an apartment uh, building, they have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, and then the density. Um, so over, over the last few months, particularly um, preparing for these bylaw changes that are coming up, um, something that, um, we've been looking at closely is really um, like Mr. Latham was saying, you know, 40R is about the affordability. And I, we'd really like to see some affordability that's to the 50% AMI than the 80% AMI, because we're losing some of the more um, affordable housing for the people that are um, underneath 80% AMI. Is that something you think you could, you could include in this? We can we can consider it, and again, because it's an apartment building, it gives us more flexibility in in how we're pricing um, the units. Okay. Okay. Josh, I see your hand raised. Did you want to offer a comment? Uh, just to quickly note that um, certainly as an apartment project, there's also Section Eight as an availability, which does allow to almost make much higher than that fifty percent AMI. So if this was condo, we'd be limited to saying these units are affordable for an apartment project allows us to meet the minimum requirements of the 80% AMI. What we often end up finding is that the Section 8 vouchers will allow folks to come in who have a greater need. So, so is that something that's after the fact? Like uh, it would just be good to know that was part of the project because there were, so, there were people that had come to um, previous meetings um, asking for that. Right. Um, well, Section 8 is granted on a, on a per applicant basis based on their financial need, and often it's, it's mutable. It's something they can take to projects based on what's available, and the intent of it is that it allows to pay uh, a more reasonable rent, but the government through Section 8 vouchers is providing that additional rent. So the short answer after all that description is that we would have the minimum required affordable units what I think you'll find with a lot of the other projects in town is that Section 8 ends up being a much higher percentage of these units would likely be affordable using Section 8 vouchers. Okay, so what you're saying is when you say you have eight, it's eight affordable units, is that what it is right now? Correct. So those could be a range really from Section 8 to 80%? They have to be at least 80%. Yeah. Um, and there's a good chance that those eight, in addition to other units, could also potentially be Section 8. Which is the lowest of the range, right? Eight units would be the lowest of the range. No, no, no. I, I mean, like, the income. So the income range would be from Section 8 eligibility to 80% for affordability. Is that right? Section 8 is, is not necessarily tied to an 80%. It's really based on an applicant process. So it could be as low as 50, 40, 30. I've seen some where somebody, a tenant only pays $50 a month. No, um, yes, I realize that. But what I'm saying is that in terms of like when you say affordable housing, it can be, it can range from someone who's eligible for Section 8, which can be, like you say, anything mm -hmm. to 80%. That's, that's the, that's sort of like the range. I didn't realize that. I thought, I thought when you said, I thought that. For this project, affordability meant 80%. So to clarify, yes, for the project minimum requirements, it has to be 80% through a lottery process. But then for any basic marketing of rental units, Section 8 is another option. So will it be an option for this one? Yes. Okay, thank you. Are there any other hands raised? Julie, I can't see everybody. Bernie, your hand is raised again. 
Yep, sorry, I didn't realize. I, I didn't think I had it er earlier raised, but anyway, my, just a couple of comments, just I'm on the park as well. And, you know, what we've seen is that the number of unit parking spaces per unit have been, um, you know, we've had a lot of commentary about from developers and, and, and CPDC that this smaller, this one and a quarter or ratio of parking spaces to residential units is sufficient. But what we've seen uh, from real data, let's say from Postmark is that it needs to be closer to two. And I think that, you know, the mistake that continues to be made by CPDC and the, and the waivers is that they're really not allocating the proper amount of spaces. The second, I, the second item is that, and, and so this project really needs to be more closer to two than what it's designed for. The, the other item with respect to compact spaces is that you cannot, you simply cannot restrict uh, or discriminate against people who don't, who, who have certain size cars in their rental agreements, or you can't manage that. It, it needs to be built into the proper uh, spaces. Um, and if you look at the actual um, cars bought in the country, uh, compact and, and medium-sized cars, uh, compact is, is far less than 10% now. SUVs and crossovers are, um, are uh, and pickups are closer to 85%. And so all other all other cars being bought are uh, SUVs, crossovers, and pickups. So you, you simply sh you can't design a space. Thirty percent of the space is to be compact, just because it's that's just not the way the world is, unfortunately. And lastly, so what you're saying that people in downtown Boston mostly own pickup trucks. I know that in Reading there's a lot of pickup trucks. I don't. Reading is, I don't, Reading is not downtown Boston, so you can't just this blanket isn't a statement. In downtown Boston, and I'm not sure that we want to make this into downtown Boston. No, no, but, but the data the data you threw out there was this blanket statement that X type of cars are being bought, but but that's sort of broken up by where they're bought and how those people use them. So very different than transit oriented. But if this is not Boston, this is a place, and I think what we're seeing is that one and a quarter is simply an inadequate ratio of spaces to, because people just, uh, you know, even if you have a one bedroom, you have a couple living there. One of them works in Waltham. The other one work, might work in Beverly or someplace else. And you cannot simply rely on the commuter rail for everybody's transportation needs. Plus they have to go to go shopping and they have to go food shopping. And there are no places in downtown Boston and uh, in downtown Reading anymore to go food shopping because we've designed that out of the downtown district. And, and, and so I guess that's the point. The other point is that in order this whole concept of that's an untrue is, statement as well i'm just not going to put up with these untrue statements we did not design out uh food sir, food shopping from the downtown nothing in no, the zoning we, takes that we out created, we created a mega site with market basket and star market in the walker brook area that was part of the town's development and in doing so that competition uh, created a situation where it was no longer viable for downtown groceries. That's probably hearsay too, because look at Lucci's in, in Wilmington. Uh, they're doing fine. They, but we don't they've have done the, fine. Right. So you don't know. You, but we you don't, don't know have, what caused that. We don't have the parking downtown to accommodate that kind of volume of grocery store traffic. Okay, that's what I mean. It's been designed out. There's no doubt Can, about it. Do, you Bernie, do you have a do, like? Can you can we get to this particular statement? Right, this is we have another agenda item yeah. later on. It would should probably at this rate be at about one a.m. Um, to right. talk about to talk about um, uh, these sorts of things. So let's get focused on this particular development, please. I think that the mistakes that have been made by CPDC in the past in granting waivers is because they haven't been requiring the developers to put a proper amount of parking in. And lastly, this whole concept that profitability is all, can only be achieved by having high density, I, I would take issue with because I have investments in a lot of developers and the developers can make money. I mean, a developer can make money if they put a single family house here, just a matter of what the, what the you know, that doesn't, but, but it doesn't require there to be a four story high density project 
developer will create the, the project to Bernie, the, the, that's all. again to this we need to be on track right? yeah because we could have that whole conversation in the in our later discussion about yeah, the we other have a, things that the town right is requiring of the developer including red, um, ground floor retail all right bernie we're going to we're going to move along with this discussion if we could and if you wanted to weigh in later when we talk about the planned updates to the guidelines and to the bylaws then you can weigh in then and that's the appropriate time. Okay. Thank you. Moving right along. All right. Do we have a motion on the floor for this project? Should we close discussion first? Um, can I, I guess I'd, I, I'll make a suggestion because I think right both Nick um, and, and Heather put some ideas out there in terms of um uh the um sure um how do i put it right the the requirements from the um from the developer's perspective of what you know what this um site needs in order to comply with all the components that that we have identified right. as 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 either wanting or requiring right um it's it's parking right at least right. 1.25 and though bernie reminded us right uh, more parking is better um uh uh ground floor retail a certain amount of ground floor retail um and and affordable units and open space right and so there's right we're pushing for for each one of those and i and um i i think that um and, and then the other right the other discussion point has been sort of the density um, the the density of the of the building, um, and and less the density um, I think, but more so the um, the massing right of the building. And so, right, these couple of comments were made, and I I guess I don't want to um, I'm going to say leave this meeting or end this this meeting without some clear idea from the board um, about what that all means and what sort of direction um, that we we want um, them to head, uh, right? I think Nick uh, requested some information about um, about um, the, you know, the performer or some sort of financial background backup for the, the claim that the, the you know, sort of need this density in order for this building to work. I guess my my uh, alternative uh, or question or approach may be that if there's a certain uh, uh, density or uh, number of units um, that we could identify that may be um, acceptable. And I think Nick, you had put something out there before, I forget what it was. Um, and, and then um, uh, really what we're looking for, right? And then and then look to sort of understand if you can't provide that, like what is it from a financial perspective um, that that you need to do? I, I just, I'm throwing that out there as a way to, to sort of move forward. Okay. If that makes sense to people. It does does um, that sounds like we need to continue have a motion to continue this and uh, have some discussion in the future about what the finances are in terms of building this particular building right well I, I think yeah I, uh, yes um, but I think that we need to, we, the board need to give them some guidance on um, what, um, spe really specifically, what are we looking for? Um, you know, I, I, I get a sense, right, from a, from, from an informal, um, uh, 
uh, hearing of different um, different comments um, and nodding of heads or what have you that um, that the board, um, if if polled right now, would uh, may not vote in favor of granting a waiver for, um, I, I'm not even sure what it is. What did you say, 78? Yes. Uh, yeah. Very. Um, and so I, I think, um, I, I guess, I don't know where else to go with this. I mean, we need to provide them with some direction and guidance from of where the, where the board is. I mean, I, my feeling is, um, right. A, a lot of the details that we have asked, right. I mean, it, it was said by others, right. There's uh, of the massing of the building and of what's in here, right. That the building is, is great. And, and Jeff's done a great job of like accommodating, uh, accommodating everything. I think, you know, Nick's point from the first, first meeting was, you know, it's, it's just too much. Um, and I guess, um, right, that comment still isn't resolved. And that's what I'm trying to get to provide some guidance on what wouldn't be too much. So we don't go around in circles more. No, no, we need to address the number of units, whether or not they can still get it down. And they need to provide some sort of pro forma statement that indicates the profitability at the reduced number and at the existing number. So I guess a, a question I'm struggling with here. I mean, it, it, I also want to give clear guidance is, you know, are any of us prepared to say, see if you can get it down to 25 units. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit arbitrary in that myself but you know there was there was talk of okay when you get it down to a certain level you need to reduce um the affordable units to seven so what's like the one more that would allow you to keep it at eight or are I, I'm, I'm trying to think around here it's like if we want to get the affordable housing you know mm -hmm. we like the commercial space <laughs> i think right. there's just too much space given to parking um what is that 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 interval that we want to say okay Try it at this and show us that it doesn't work. And I don't know that I have the answer, but you know, maybe we can do some group think on this. Well, I'm looking at the approved and pending 40R projects that is provided for our discussions later on. Mm. Um, postmark is set at 52 units per acre. The Chronicle is 53. Uh, 18 Woburn Street was 63. I would think that aiming for the 55 to 60 range, pushing more for the 55, at least would give us a guidance for the developer. Uh, unless the developer would prefer to come back with justification for the 78. I'm not saying he has to provide pr financials, but as Nick has requested, justify why 78 is required for this site, as opposed to desirable. Does that sound appropriate? Yes, that does. Jeff, you, yeah. you're still there? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Um, okay, your response? So yeah, for next presentation, um, sounds like we'll need to have a, tight, a, a clear presentation of those items, unless Josh or Jamie want to add anything. Um, I think not to not to reiterate something that we've already said a couple times, um, but we really strong we strongly believe that this particular site across from the train station not only is the right place to put more density, but is also the right type of project to help complete and activate the downtown um, along Haven Street. So. For us, it's it's not just a question of numbers, but it's also a question of what what can this building do to you know to really activate and energize the downtown. And for us, the density that we're proposing is the right number. But we we are happy to provide further justification. I think we'll need that. Do we have a motion to continue this project? To see that Josh Wait. has his hand. Okay. Well, Josh. 
Thank you. I was just going to ask, um, we're hearing everything you're saying. I was just going to ask if Mr. DeRazo could repeat um, what he said so that I can make sure I, I transcribe it correctly. I'd be happy to. Um, what I said was that um, we should be looking at a, um, a 55 to 60 units per acre range, preferring closer to the 55 as to the 60. Conversely, if that's not possible, significant justification of why the development needs to meet needs 78 units per acre. Oh, I had it the first time. I wish I could rewind it. Um, <laughs> justification for it as the pilots required as opposed to desired. Or wherever you end up between, you know, high 50s and, and you know, uh, the 78 you're at. Right, if, if you find a way to split the difference. I think they're at 75 right now. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I just I said 78 only because I thought that's what yeah. you would. Yeah, it's 75. It's 0. Right. 0.413 acres. I think the CBDC should decide if that, that 55 to 60 is what you, you all want them to strive for. Well, like I said from the first meeting, I was in the mid-60s. So 28 units is 67, 68 units per acre. Does 65 to 70 make more sense? So the, 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 what we're hearing from some of the feedback that we'll hear later on today is that that 60 number is like they want to top it out around 60 or so. Um, and 28 was a number that stuck in my head when I was looking at this. Now, here's the thing. All the other complaints are about parking. And so even if you go down to 28 units, nothing else changes, right? Because, you know, we're supposed to have two units per two unit, two parking spaces for every unit or something stupid like that. Um, so, you know, you'd still need the, all the parking in there. You just might have some of it available for the retail space. But really, all you're doing is reducing the mass. Well, can I ask a question? Yes. Introduce yourself, please, Patrick. Yeah. So it's Patrick McCarty. I'm the civil on this project, which really is a small role on this particular one. I'm, I'm used to being the guy talking. <laughs> and so I've been sitting here quietly and I'm, I've been trying to think of the right way to pose this question all night. So I'm just going to say it and forgive me if it comes out not how I intend it to be. But, but as far as the density, it, it, we're at 31 units now. And if we go down to 28, it, as Mr. Safina is proposing, or 23 if you took the 55 units per acre that doesn't necessarily mean anything with the building would change it could still be four stories it could still have the same footprint and the same elevations the units could simply get bigger so i i think that's the question that i was struggling with is is the board trying to say 31 units is too many and if we go down to 28 units the building is going to get smaller i don't think that on our side, we kind of understood what you're asking us to make for the next round of revisions. Are you looking for both the unit count to go down and then a corresponding reduction in building height or footprint? Yes. You, assuming that's a linear equation, I guess is what I'm asking. Yes, I think we are. Uh, I'm okay with the building height. It's just that I think that when you start taking units away, you have the opportunity to reduce height or make pockets you know, you start to break up the, the building more, so. Oh yeah, no, we certainly do have that option. I don't think the to... units get bigger. I think the unit types are appropriate. Uh, I don't think you could, for example, somebody said take off the third story. I understand that that's not reasonable to take away 10 units. That's probably too many, mm -hmm. um, but you know, you could also prove that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not saying that we would necessarily keep everything the same size and just reduce the unit count, but I wanted to make sure that we were heading in the right direction, that it wasn't just the assumption that if you take off units, the building automatically gets smaller. So it's really a combination of the two, the mass of the building itself and the unit count is what the concern is. Yeah, okay. correct. Yes. Okay, can we have a motion to continue this project? Yes, I'll move to continue. The hearing for six to 16 shoots. Oh, go ahead. 
so so is that you all agree that that's what you want the the applicant to walk away and, yes. and to do okay so i believe sure. so so is it 55 to 60 or what is it more like what nick said which and i don't want to speak for nick but it sounded like he was more around 65 Nick, you're muted. Try and get the mouse back over there. Okay. Yeah, I was okay with that mid-60. 60, okay. Um, and Julie, to be precise, I'm throwing out the number 55 to 60 as a starting point. If they come back and reduce the, um, they hit 65, but they've reduced the massing of the building, then we'll probably be more amenable to granting waivers. Okay, thank you. That's helpful to, to, to staff because we do a lot of the follow-up conversations and coordination with the project team, as you know. Um, and then I did want to say your agenda on February 7th has four things on it already. So mm. there's not, you know, we're looking at February 28th and this time slot, that's a bit, that whole agenda is available. So that could be 7.30. Go ahead and put it on at 7.30. Okay, um, so now I'll move to continue the public hearing for the 40-hour plan review for 616 Shoot Street to February 28th at 7.30. We have a second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Gary's excellent. Next Thanks, item, Rick. thank you. Next item on the agenda is continued public hearing zoning bylaw amendment, floodplain overlay district. Is that the only section we're looking at right now? What happened to all of the uh, signage stuff that was on there? Yeah, it's down below. Yeah, th this is a, um, just a brief update. It was scheduled at 8.30. And then the signage is supposed to come after. Um, so you, so just to remind CPDC, we're considering making changes to the floodplain overlay district um, to bring it into compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program. But there are map amendments coming in 2023, and so it probably makes sense to wait and do all the amendments together, like you had suggested. We we look into. Um, we should. So, so I think that can be pushed off to a future year. Yep. Okay. If you agree, we will uh, close that hearing and be done with it. Oh, uh, oh can I make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> yes, unless anyone please. Wants, unless anyone wants to make uh, public comments or all the rest of the stuff. No, I, th I think it's good to delay it, pull it all together, and then less it once and we'll and reopen all. it is what we'll do right okay well yep. we'd have to re advert it won't be reopened it'll be a, it'll a whole new year whole new advertisement whole new sh all this shebang whole shebang got it yeah um so julie before wait before we go um <laughs> you close in on do you know like when in 23 or i assume that you got that information from dep or or someone yeah, it was a DCR and um, NFIP. So um, I don't remember off the top of my head what month. Um, I think prior ones typically come out in the summer. So it might be something that we do like in a November town meeting. Okay, um, so I, I just wanted to write just so that we knew, yeah. right, we've got time. I, we've, we've got it scheduled in the right way so that it, so we're there when it's there. Right. Yeah. And again, it's not like 100% certain they'll come out in 2023, but that is what's projected. So okay. um, we, we'll keep on top of that. And I, I'm sure I have the actual uh, uh, okay. uh, or closer approximation somewhere in my notes. I just don't remember off the top of my head. Excellent. Moving right along. Signage. Okay. Wait, Hold on. So I got to I gotta, I gotta officially close the public hearing on that, right? Yep, so I'll move to close the public hearing on the zoning bylaw amendment on section 10.1 floodplain overlay district. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Excellent. Hand count? Yes? Yes? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. Moving right along. It's supposed to be at 835, but now we're on to Master 
signage plan application for 136 Haven Street, the postmarked project. We have a representative from Diabiasi. Is yes. that how I pronounce it? Diabiasi. Ah. You go to Biasi. I'm also here with Josh Latham, and we actually have some of the other um, unit owners as well uh, representing the commercial aspect of, of this project. But I'll let uh, Josh, do you want to kick it off for us? If that's uh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Good evening, Josh Latham. Um, I'm actually appearing for you uh, tonight on behalf of the three business owners over at the Postmark. That includes the Biasi companies, uh, the Common District Meeting House, which is a new restaurant that's going to be going into the historic portion of the uh, old post office building and then classified realty. Um, so what we presented tonight is, is a request for master signage approval. Um, I know you're all very familiar with this property, uh, historic site, a 40 r project. Um, and as I know you're also familiar, there is uh, no real signage uh, bylaw that applies to the downtown smart growth district. We instead, the board has interpreted that we use the underlying district. So within the signed bylaws, we're following the business B district. Um, what we presented tonight is to request wall signage for the DiBiase companies. Uh, they're the unit really in the, um, on the corner uh, where, where Andrew is pointing out. Uh, and then for the common district meeting house, instead of requesting wall signage, we're requesting a freestanding sign in the location within the mulch bed behind the granite wall. And then third is the new uh, commercial addition for classified realty, and that would include wall signage on that Haven Street side, and then a blade sign on the portion facing easterly up Haven Street. Um, a little bit of the history here. So as you probably all know, there was a freestanding sign already approved for this project to identify the residential entrance, uh, exactly where Andrew's showing it. Uh, within the Business B District, you can only um, have one freestanding sign allowed by special permit. This board did grant that special permit. Um, as a result, we were unable to, to come before the board for a special permit to request a new freestanding sign for the restaurant. Therefore, we went to Reading Historic Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, Historic Commission has submitted feedback, uh, but they do prefer the idea of having a freestanding sign in this mulch bed rather than a sign that would go on the historical facade of the existing post office. And the Zoning Board of Appeals um, back in mid-December granted a variance to allow us this second freestanding sign. Uh, what we've presented within these plans, and uh, we also have with us Mike Correa of Boston Building Wraps. He's, um, he can speak to the actual details of the signage. Um, but we're requesting permission for these three or these four sign locations, and we've provided uh, copies of what that signage would be. We did receive feedback from Reading Historical. Um, one comment was that they wanted the lettering for the DBIC companies to match the lettering for the Haven Street signage uh, for classified realty. We've done that, and that's now reflected in the current plans. Um, I know another comment was that the freestanding sign for the Common District Meeting House, they'd prefer to see it smaller. We're currently proposing 32 square feet. Um, freestanding signage in the business B is 35 square feet as a max, um, but 32 is what the, uh, the restaurant is proposing. Um, but certainly we'd look for any feedback you might have and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, my first question is for the Common Street, Common District sign. And uh, the question is whether or not that's going to be lit. You don't so show they, any lighting. What they would like to do is have some dark sky compliant uh, ground lighting during really business hours so that it, it, it doesn't get lost as somebody may be coming down for dinner and not see the sign. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be, again, something they'd request would be dark sky compliant and meeting any technical requirements that the, the commission might have. So there will be lighting that shines up on this. That would, be the, that would be the request, yes. Okay. Jump in any time. I've got a lot of questions on these. Anybody else? Well, I'll go through your questions. Okay. The uh, if I'm if my math is correct, the Diabasi company's sign is twenty one square feet. Is that right? Uh, 
or more, it's slightly more. Probably slightly more if it's 21 times one and change. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you've also got a blade sign for the classified on the corner. If I'm seeing that correctly, yes, that steps back about two feet off that corner. Doesn't show it here, but in the, the color coded, yes, yes, right about there. So that's the classified sign. And it, are those two different companies? No, that's that's the same um, classified realty is occupying that space. And mm -hmm. under the business B, they can do wall signage on one side and then the blade sign facing the other side. Seems to be overkill for me. And you didn't include the signage for the the other portion of that's on the back side of this building. That's correct. You've already gotten approvals for that. Correct. Uh, this this commission actually issued a special permit for that, dating back to December fourteenth of twenty twenty. Okay. Okay. Those are my two questions or comments. There are questions about classified realty and the DiBiase companies. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that they're not a 24 hour business and basically they run, oh, you know, standard bankers hours. Would that be correct? For use of that space, for use of the actual commercial uh, space on that property? Right. Yes. Is that the question? Uh, for from from my company, that's our corporate office. Um, so yes, yeah, so we use those for typical working hours. Construction being just on the a little bit earlier side, um, but it's it's not a retail showroom. It's not something like that. And nor is it a function of the property management twenty four seven operation. So my, I I really wonder why you need so much lighting on the, these signs. You're talking mostly about the halo signs, Tony? Uh, the halo signs. It, mm -hmm. I understand that people love signs and they love to have their business lit up so that people notice it 24 hours a day. But the reality is, even classified realty, they're going to be closed at 7, 8 o'clock at night. There's really no reason that you're trying to draw people into the building at that time of night. And I, I'm confused how you could have any dark sky compliant uh, ground lighting on the common district, which wouldn't be bad so long as that light is turned off when uh, the business is closed. Right. Um, I'll, I'll chime in on one thing. I was also interested in dark sky compliant upward lighting and I looked it up and it has to do with the color temperature. Um, and on that one, I guess I'll just say for a restaurant, I do think it's helpful to have lighting. I, I agree. Um, that sign would have to be lit so people can see it because you're looking for customers to come in to let them know where the entrance is. But for the others, yep. it's like an office building saying, why am I, why do you have it lit at night? Right. Save a little bit of electricity. But that's a preference more than anything else. So typically, right, when we approve a sign and it has lighting, we um, have the information about the lighting. Um, so, you know, typically we wouldn't approve a sign that says, um, yeah, yeah, we'll get you the lighting information later. 
and I'm, you know, referring mostly to the, to the, um, uh, the halo. No, the restaurant sign, right? There's uh, no lighting, right? Um, uh, that, that's not right. specified. There's no crew right, neck. There's right. no floodlight coming up from the bottom. There's nothing. Um, I guess I, I, I don't have any problem with the other signs. I, I understand um, about the, your comment, uh, Tony, about the, the lighting. I think, right, the one that stands out to me, um, that always stands out to me, right, is the um, Keller. Um, what is that what it is? No. Um, right there. Keller Williams on the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The Reading Co op Bank. Yes. Um, that's sort of overly lit up um, and lit up all the time. Um, I think that we did have a discussion about that too, right? Because their entrance is a little bit of a, is, is in a different location, right? It's not right there, right where the sign is. And I, I do recall some discussion about, about um, sort of needing the additional guidance um, that the lighting provides. You know, it, it still is, seems a little bit overkill. Um, but, uh, but to my real comment here, um, I, I guess I'm a little surprised at the size of that freestanding sign um, and that the historic district thought that that was okay. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the sign of by itself. I mean, the sign itself, um, but it does, it does seem to overpower the view of the front. Um, Good point. And I, I'm just, I guess I'm surprised that the historic commission, they worked and you all right, uh, worked so hard at preserving the front of that building and then to put up this sort of Garish. average looking sign, um, you know, that is in every, you know, every town in New England um, and so big and, and sort of taking up too much space there. I, I would personally recommend it being a little bit smaller. Yeah, I agree. My concern was the size of it, but also because it's mount, it's up on that um, raised area. When you walk by it, it's just looming over you, right? I mean, it's four yeah, feet high yeah. plus the grade change. It's, it's, it's well above you. It seems like it could be smaller. That's the only complaint I have about that one. The... Uh, classified blade sign seems incongruous with the rest of the design though i don't get it yep i assume it's lit from the top is it a lit sign it looks no, like it's, it's being this lit crook neck. is yep. it lit yes lit from, the top. from the top yeah i don't know i don't get the design of that sign the coloring the the background it's just like someone took a white piece of plywood and pasted a logo on it so that one I don't think is is doing much for the building. And it's two feet off that corner. So you can see both signs at one look. The whole point I would think with the blade sign is to make it more pronounced because you don't have the, the view of the other sign. I think I think you're right there a little bit. Um, it probably belongs on the other corner perpendicular to the street, right? Because who's going to see this except for maybe people across the street in the lawyer's office there? Right. Or whatever's across the street, right? It, it doesn't make any sense to have a blade sign that's perpendicular to the, the direction of travel. And I, I understand if you put it on the lead side, you're blocking it from the direction of travel, right? Because Haven Street's a one way. So it looks like it belongs down the other corner. Is the door over there? I didn't think the door was on that side. I don't know. No, it looks like it's right there. Yeah. I mean, just because you're allowed two signs doesn't mean you should throw one on there. It just doesn't look like it's working. Right. Jonathan, please. Uh, we're still we're still communicating as a board, so until we pass it over, uh, I'll have to hold back on your comments. But you did approve this sign for the 
the district, correct? Well, that's the uh, what I wanted to clarify. Yeah, Jonathan Barnes and I am on the uh, Historical Commission. Just to be clear, and we sent a letter uh, from our chair to the um, CPDC. Uh, we did not uh, support the size of the freestanding sign for the restaurant. We uh, recommended that that be smaller. Thank you. Thank you. Clarifies that. Okay, any other comments from the board? I agree with what others have said. I think we should um, take, take the cue from the Historical Commission. Agree. Okay. Do we have somebody from the signage company on the line? Yes, I'm here, Michael Correa. Uh, hi. What's your thought in terms of the size of this common district sign? Um, I tend to agree. It, it does kind of overpower the, um, the front of the building. Um, you know, typically we, something like this, you know, we could lower it to the ground as well and maybe make it a, a four by six. Um, right now it's a typical four by eight, um, right. but maybe a four by six might work better there. Um, you know, the granite posts, I know that's um, maybe a historical thing, but those also are pretty beefy in themselves. They're seven by seven. Um, so those, you can also switch out, you know, that material to a, you know, a, a maybe a, a black aluminum post there that may slim it down. Um, that might be I, better. Excuse me? It might be better because you have a wrought iron, black wrought iron in behind it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Um, so that may that may also you know slim it down and make it you know less beefy. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think maybe a four by six would work there. You don't want to go too small because you know you want the restaurant to still get their name out there and you know have some type of advertisement, especially nowadays with all the the trouble that the restaurant industry is going through. But um, yeah, I think it could go down in size a little bit. My thoughts are, you, know, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want it to be too low, right? Because in this, this photo is great because you can see where the top of that, that car is, right? You, and you do, you know, you want to be able to at least see it, uh, you know, at least the, the, the main, um, you know, the common district over top of the car, right? You don't want it just assigned behind a car. Um, and so, you know, it does need to be up a little bit. And um, so I'm, I'm not, you know, just from a functionality standpoint, I'm not sure you want to raise it too low. I guess uh, whether it's four by six or two by eight, um, which I would think that long and thin might work, work a little bit better and, and be less uh, obtrusive, but I, I don't know. Uh, I like the idea of of also without the granite post because it does right. just it would just slim it down too. So, yep. <clears throat> okay. All right. And what was your thought in terms of the classified sign, the yellow blade sign? Can you do without it? Where's where's you go? I think Maureen, uh, the yeah, owner of that. I'll, of the I'll weigh in. Uh, my, oh, name is Maureen, uh, my name is Maureen Giuliano. I'm the broker owner of Classified Realty. Okay. Um, the sign, if you're coming down Haven Street, you will not even see that our business is there in that spot. And, and as you come down, it's on a decline um, and a, a slightly on a decline. And if you drive by, you're going to be by the building and have to turn your head back to see the sign there. It's, it's fine on the front where the door is um, for foot traffic and things like that. Um, but I really, you know, the the, the colors, I, I many people don't care for the colors, but it is our, you know, company colors. And I do think that people will see 
it coming down Haven Street alert them to that's where our office is. Um, it probably makes sense for the sign to be turned at a little bit of an angle more towards looking up Haven Street. Sure. I agree with that. Um, we originally wanted it just flat on the, right off the corner facing um, up the street, but was requested to add it to be a blade sign, which I agreed to. I've agreed to change the font on on what our typical font is to try to you know fit in. So I really want the sign on the corner. I think it's what's going to uh, somebody's going to be able to see as they come down the street. If you're coming down, you're going to see uh, DiBiase Homes, which is really nice at the right angle coming down Haven. And then the other sign is, is you know, depending upon the size and the lighting, is great for the space. And I just want the same visibility. Any comments from the board? Well, like I said, at, at the current angle, it's the same as the front. So it you're is. not really going to see it until you get to it. Um, I do think the angle, I, I do think the angle needs to change a bit from the, from the, the, the sign that you're seeing there. Well, that's why it needs to be on the front at the other corner. Because it wouldn't be a blade sign if it was flat against the wall, it'd be a wall sign. Mm -hmm. They make, they have where you can put two, um, two posts coming out to make it come off the building as a blade sign, but um, not to get into sign design, but that that's one thing. If it's on the other side, it's down even further. And if you see where the, the door is, it's, it's quite a bit lower at that point as you're coming down the road. So tell me where the entrance to classified is. It's right under underneath where it says, like right underneath where it says classified in the black. That those two doors that are a little bit darker, that's mm -hmm. where it is. Okay. Yeah, none of these views are really doing it justice. If you look no. at the street view, you can see the angle of the facades and understand what it's doing. It's all a little confusing there because the, the, the building number, right, is, is mm -hmm. going to mesh in with the, with the, um, the wall sign. Mm -hmm. The blade sign should be where the building number is. Yep. Yeah, go back up the street. And granted, we're on top of the truck here, but you can see that. So that that angle that that thing is canted at, if this sign, if the blade sign is perpendicular on that east wall, can't see it. Uh, it's not visible. Mm -mm. Is there something um, in the bylaw saying that the second sign must be a, a blade sign? <laughs> So I believe they are allowed a wall sign on a different facade by a limited size. I think when the original application came in, it was sort of like a vinyl signage, which didn't meet the design guidelines. Um, so that was requested for change. And then it became the blade sign as proposed. Why are they allowed a second sign? No. Uh, they don't have don't a public park or I'm mean, not. Public way or something like that. Pull up. We just went through this for another application. One second, just pull it up. The exact language. So, for multi tenant buildings in business B, a business occupying the ground floor is allowed two signs if one is a wall mounted sign and the second sign is a projecting blade sign, an awning sign, or a wall-mounted sign located on a different building facade than the first wall-mounted sign. So they I'll are- be uh, just as happy to have a wall-mounted sign if that's your preference. Oh. 
Okay, can you get creative and actually wrap that corner with the word classified and not have the halo sign on the other facade? Then you'd see it all the way down the road. No, how do you do that? Then what would you see? Ass? Assified? I mean, how much of it do you wrap? That doesn't work. <laughs> Well, the, the, it's got to be, it, it's got to be perpendicular to Haven Street, right? Because that's the only way you're going to see it. So it either needs to go on the far end where the number is, it needs to be perpendicular to Haven Street, sort of where you're seeing it. So turn 90 degrees or uh, a wall sign that's, you know, mounted in that little, you know, in the area where you're showing, sort of where you're showing it now. But I, I, I don't like, like I, I don't like the idea of a wall sign that has you know that sort of doesn't match up with the rest of the um, the signage on the the building. I think that sort of that doesn't really work. So I I get it having a um, blade sign. Um, I, I personally think it works. It would work better down where the building number is, but you know. I don't have that much strong of opinion as long as it's perpendicular to Haven Street. The one, the one comment from, uh, if I can make from when we um, were finishing this building, um, the building numbers um, and the placement thereof, actually the, the, the same uh, sign company uh, performed that work for us. Um, but they do, uh, it, it is a requirement by the fire department um, and I'm, you know, those are those were approved back then. So I just don't if we go ahead and move the numbers around, which I'm open to, but you know, just want to make sure that um, you know, entrances are are numbered correctly. That's part of the fire fire department. The knock box is close is right below that number too. So um I'm not sure if that plays into it. And then the 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 other those two little openings that you see, those are scuppers for uh, overflow drain for the retail uh, outdoor dining space for commercial space number two. So, um, you know, it's it's truly a mixed mixed use um, setup there. So I think um, we we may need to get a little creative um, because it'd be tip, difficult to uh, put the word classified or, or to have a sign run through those scuppers too. So the water um, is going to run through there. Yeah. Oh, a reminder, the second wall sign is only allowed to be half as large as the first one. So it looks like it would fit between those two water spouts. Uh, I'm, my recommendation is the blade sign just um, sort of on that corner, that front, <laughs> I don't know what side that is, but that front, the front corner closest to us in the view that we're looking at, but just perpendicular to Haven Street. I, I wouldn't be supportive of another wall sign that doesn't match the rest of them. Yep. And I get the whole issue with putting it down the street. So it, just to chime in here, um, as as far as matching Who's the sign, speaking? this is uh, Mike from uh, Boston Building Wraps. Okay. I um, What if we, and Maureen, this is totally up to you, I guess, but what if we went more with the guidelines of the colors you, you have the black stainless steel we could incorpor incorporate that into the sign changing the yellow um to a um light stainless steel and the classified to a black stainless steel um and then you can we could also um either halo lit those or um download down like them like we're showing um but if it's going to be a wall sign we you might want to have these internally lit if you are still going with the lights. Um, I'm just saying to keep with the the color scheme. Um, I know people are saying they don't like the yellow and the and the um the maroon there, but I'm just just to throw that that idea out there, we can incorporate all the same finishes to the other sign. I, you know, I, I think the sign loses uh some 
sort of brand recognition and with the with the purple and the gold. So my preference is to stay with that. Yeah, it was just it was just, just a thought to help get get on the building. Seems like we have some items that we need revised specs and some external spec sheets for the freestanding side. Yes. And then maybe some concepts for this sign. So that we can work with the applicant on and they can work with their team. Okay. I agree with that. Anybody else? Uh, can I make a request of Mr. Corrier? Um, yeah. Maybe swap out that 130 on uh, the classified to match the font of the uh, other sign. Um, yes, that's so. I guess that's up to to you, go. Um, so the 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 intent the intent is for the black lettering of the proposed new signs to equal the lettering and the font and the size of the existing numbers that are on the on the building right now on the on the three different 130 136 and 144 to keep it to keep it consistent that's that's the intent i'm not sure if that got across through the drawings or not but. no the fonts are not the same so that does need to match up uh, we, we can uh, make that edit why why do they have to match i don't understand i mean they Put this in front of us. The 130 classified piece looks okay to me. The you're not showing it, but the proposed sign of the front of that, I understand what it's doing. The the name of the company is different than the address number, but that happens elsewhere, right? It's just a stylistic thing as far as I'm concerned. Yep. You you've got two clashing fonts on the same uh facade. They can they can technically leave it alone. It's my recommendation that they at least mimic the font from a Helvetica to what it looks like a uh, more of a Times Romanish. But we're being told that the intent was that they would match, so we can. Yeah, that's that's what, that's what that's yeah. what yeah that's what we were we're doing. That was a, also not a written recommendation, but that was a, a verbal recommendation uh, with the historic um, commission as well. Sure. All right. So it looks like you need to do a modification of the common district to scale that down and to have wrought iron or black posts, smaller, also skinnier. And the classified sign needs to be repositioned. Correct. And some information about the lighting for the um, for the freestanding sign. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Was there, so, was there a size that you guys um, had in mind for the freestanding sign? Yes. I think wasn't the important thing to make it shorter. Okay. I think that I think that if you went to the four by six like four you recommended, six. or if it was mm -hmm. an eight by two or two and a half, I think that would be fine. Yep. Uh, personally, right, just a, a little bit, right? We're not asking, or at least I'm not thinking that you need to completely shrink it down. I I think just you know that sort of um, um, order of magnitude reduction I think would work along with the change in posts. Right. And the lighting on that, yes. I, that's my opinion. I, I'm not sure Great. if other board members have other thoughts on it, but. But let's remember that they're dimensioning from the very top of the arc, right? So the the panel itself is most of the panel itself is less than four feet high. Yeah. So I'm thinking like yeah. six by three and a half feet probably gets you the same thing, or you know, you drop it, you go six by for the way it's shown here, but you drop it down just a little bit so that it's not as imposing in height. Right. There's no competition there, right? There's there's just nothing happening immediately before this and immediately after this or across the street. Right. And so 
it's a visible sign. And where's the actual restaurant location? That's not shown. The, the restaurant's actually the original entrance to the post office. Okay. And will you be requiring yet another sign for above that space? They're not actually seeking any other signage right now. It would okay. really just be this one sign. Okay. I think there was, um, if I may just um, to speak to that a little bit, there was a, a good emphasis and a, and, a, and a good forth effort um, to not put a sign on the 1918 historical facade uh, and to really keep that after the, after we re repointed that and put in brand new columns and, and, and other features, you know, to really keep that um, looking uh, clean and, and, and how it currently looks. So. Okay. So that may mean that you move the sign closer to the st uh, stairs that go up. Rather That's than correct. Um, also, with, the, with regards to the variance, ZBA approved it, but with the idea that it would really, it wouldn't necessarily be what's shown in this picture. It would be within the bed. Um, and the idea is it would be set back a little bit further um, and then obviously appropriate um, sizing. Right. We have a motion to continue this discussion. Yes, I'll move to continue the master signage plan application discussion at 136 Haven Street until. So like I mentioned earlier, February 7th is um, starting to feel impossible, but let me just think for a second. Yeah, I mean, we might be able to squeeze it in around like, I don't know, eight o'clock, but it's, it's just, everything's gonna take longer than we have time allocated. So I just, I don't know if, or if, if wait till February 28th, you could put it at 8.30 or nine. So. So do we have a date? February 28th? Seems a long way away. But yeah, I'd like to hear what the what you go and Josh and the te their team think about that. Uh, Julie, what, what would be the time frame, the lead time to submit the updated um, design drawings in advance of the February 7th hearing? Yeah, I mean, a week for signage is usually what we ask for. Um, and there's only, a, you know, that's just two weeks from today, right? So. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind my asking, you go. Do you think that's enough time for us to get this revised? Uh, I believe so. Um, um, I do as I'm well. Not, I mean, I, I just don't I'm know. optimistic. But uh, yeah. Mike's on the phone. Mike, Mike's yeah, on the I, phone too. I can have it revised tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so okay. I, I think if we just get a little more direction from uh, Maureen and the unit owner uh, of the restaurant. Um, you know, in terms of maybe we can get a couple mock-ups done internally just to see what, what we like, and then we can uh, submit that uh, as a new application, as a modified application uh, before next Monday. Excellent. Sounds good. So then yep. you could do, you could, you could, we could schedule it at eight, eight o'clock yep. on February 7th. Okay, let me try that again then. Let, I'll move to um, continue the review of the master signage plan application for 136 Haven Street until February 7th at 8 p.m. Is there a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Yes. 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 Excellent. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you then. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. We'll talk faster next time. <laughs> Moving right along. Sign permit application for 531 Main Street, Reading Chronicle 40R residential signage. We have representatives from that project. I believe Ray is here, sign mechanic, um, and he's by phone. So let me just share the rendering on the screen. But go ahead, Ray. I'm, I'm on the phone, Andrew. Yep. We're asking to put stainless steel letters on the leading edge of the canopy as shown in the drawing that we have presented. They'd be lit from the bottom with a uh, 3,000 K 
LED strip that's angled back towards the letter and has a sky guard shroud along the top of it to prevent light from escaping straight up into the sky. It's also a 40 lumen fixture that is a uh, not very bright fixture, basically, with a very wide and low photometric profile. So lighting fixture is designed not to project light very far. Pretty detailed drawing. The uh, 15.8 square foot sign, which I think is within the uh, allowance. There's an address sign on the building to the left of the door, four and a half inch letters. And the historic commission has asked for a plaque to be on the side of the building, which is also shown text of which has not been decided yet. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh Yes, I think the term is registration, but I think the spacing between the letters is cramped. They need to be spaced out a little bit more so they can be discovered easier. You see what I mean? No, I don't actually. They're, uh, it's a condensed type space. Mm -hmm. it is, uh, it's similar to uh, what the logo for the building is. And... Uh, if you spread the letters out, it makes the sign more square footage. And uh, we wanted it to not occupy the entire space across the, uh, the canopy. So we actually like the way it's positioned uh, the way it is. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate your explanation. Comments from the board. My, my, I like the sign though. I, you know, this sheet that's up, well, you're on the phone. You can't see it. Um, uh, or maybe you can, um, I, I, I have it in front of me. Okay. Um, I, I like that. Um, my question is really about the building and how it sits on the building. Um, and not necessarily this sign, but what else is planned for this, um, this facade and, and where would it go? Do you know? I don't think I understand the question. It's shown on the facade, the leading edge of the canopy. There's a side so, view. Yeah, yeah. So is this going to be the right view? You've got that. This is there's the one entrance, right? And then is that the only? I forget. Is it right? There's another entrance into the this retail the space. Only sign, this is the only sign that's being asked for for this building. For the, if there's a retail space, that's got nothing to do with me. All right, that's a that's a. Uh, this is just a building response. name, right now. That's a fair response, but it, I sort of exactly my concern um, is is I, I want to sort of want to understand how this because there, there's there's going to end up being a, a sign for the retail space. Um, there has to, there has to be at least something. So I'm just yeah, trying to then, envision but how then this sets together. the this sets the tone, right? So um, anything that comes no, the after retail this, would, the retail would be different because it's going to look like the retail. This is this is designed to look like a sign for the building. I believe that your bylaws allow for a 16 square foot sign for a building name, which this is what this is, and uh, I believe that the lighting is within the um fits the definition of your of your sky guard require or your your uh, dark sky requirements mm -hmm. uh so if the retail people come in later with their requests for signage you guys would have to review that on its own merits or we could make it be more cohesive with what what the flavor of this is right Why would what, that's what that? i'm saying <sighs> Fuck. um sorry I just threw up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, because we don't want 50 million different signs across this such a small facade, right? They have to talk to each other somewhat. And so uh, if you look at some of the master signage plans, buildings have a pattern language that sort of marches down the building and each entity 
fits within that flavor. Um, and then, you know, you can allow creativity within that as well. I'm not saying it's going to be this sign with another name on it. I'm just saying that this is going to set the tone. I like this sign. I think it's appropriate for this building. Um, but I don't think it's any, I don't think it's wrong for us to then say the rest of the building follows suit somehow. Maybe it's not literal, but there's, there is some, excuse me, some dialogue that goes on that, um, that happens because of the sign. So then when those people come and apply for a sign, you could compare them to the existing signage and have them comply with this sign. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I, I, no, I, I brought I, it up. <laughs> I, I brought it up just because, right, the, the, I, I sort of want to understand, like, what else are we in for for this building? And how does this, you know, set the tone or, um, you know, um, minimize the ability to do something else or maximize the ability or, um, you know, I, I even, I, I'm having a hard time seeing where the retail sign is going to go. But as you point out, that's not your problem. Um, and, you know, they'll have to get creative. Well, they can have a blade sign yeah. too, you know, they yeah. let them do it. This sign yeah. is good for I, what, what we're getting presented. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. It's sleek. It's, it's truly a minimalist sign it's not uh yep it, it, it's it's not intended to be a retail this is a building identification sign it's not a, it's not going to scream at you it's not a retail sign it's an architectural sign yep no it's good it it's actually very classic sort of uh, references almost um i don't want to say newspapers but you know it has that sort of feel to it well that's what we did we went through yeah. a long type uh typography selection and we settled on this because we thought it had character yeah, no, it's nice. I like it. It's made out of premium materials. It's a three-quarter inch stainless plate, water jet cut. So, do we know the temperature of the light source? Three thousand K. It's in a it's in a red box on the grid in the bottom right hand okay. side of the first page. Yep. Thank you. Forty forty lumens and the photometric data is there as well as well as a picture of the fixture. Nope, this is good detail. So I would like- Okay, wait a second, hold on. Just one more thing though. I wanna sure. make sure that from, okay, the, the light source itself is entirely hidden, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a thing in front of it, cool. All right, and the material- In front of it to, and on the sides too, and on top. Okay. And um, the finish on this, on these letters is matte. Is it a matte finish? It's, 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 it's a satin stainless. Satin stainless, okay. Okay, that's good, like thank a, you. Like a refrigerator. Yep. Okay. So it's not polished. It's not gonna reflect the specular highlight. Still camping. I still with you guys? Yep. yep. Yeah, I'm having a small problem. Um, you said this is an identification sign? It's the building ID sign. Which would fall under special regulation C in the bylaw? In business you say zone so. B, 8.5.3? I think this is in the overlay district. The, the, the downtown smart growth district does not have sign regulations. So they revert back to the underlying zoning of business B. Okay. I think it's so, different for, I think it's different for residential buildings. I will say Tony in section 912 of the design guidelines, it reads a residential only development or the residential component of a mixed use development project shall be permitted one sign at the principal entrance to the site. The sign shall identify the name or and or address of the development and shall not exceed 16 square feet. Okay, that's the one I was reading. All right, because under special regulations, there's other limitations for it. Yes. All right, so Great. 
Um, okay, so. should we open up uh, this for discussion for anybody who's online who wants to weigh in on this? The signage for the Chronicle building. Um, I guess from me, this would be the only question I have for the applicant. If it is illuminated, do you know? I guess similar, we ask the question all the time, how late into the night those lights would be on till? Whatever your bylaws allow. Usually towns require it to be off at 11 o'clock at night, but I don't know what your town requires. It would be on a timer, not a photo cell. Ten works, eleven works for the commute. Whatever. Ten o'clock. Yep. Is it ten o'clock? Yes. That would that's fine with uh, fine with us. Okay. Okay. I'll check to see if there are any other requirements on that as well. And you're not going to have any kind of awning, is that correct? This is mounted on the building. It's mounted on the leading edge of the canopy, that the entrance canopy. It's not an awning, oh. so it's hard structure that's part of the building. There's a side view of it on page two. Ah. Oh. Plan sheet show up right now. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Yep. So this is the canopy here. And this is where the sign would be. Okay. If there are any questions on the certificate itself. I'm sorry, did I, was there a question? No, nope, we're just reading the text. Oh, okay. We have a motion. Can we, can we move this on? Yeah, yeah, I think we can. Um, I sorry. I'll move to approve the certificate of appropriateness for the sign application. Thank you for uh, 531 Main Street. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Yes. 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 From me? Yes. yes. Good, we're yes. approved. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. I think it looks pretty good. Aim to please. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you, Ray. I'll get you that certificate as soon as I can over the week. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Appreciate the email.
You have a good evening now. I'm I'm signing off, okay? Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. Okay. Continued public hearing, proposed zoning zoning bylaw. Section 10.5, Downtown Smart Growth District 40R Overlay. Before we get going on this, can, um, can we take two or three minutes? We should take two or three minutes. Good. We all returning to the fold. Andrew, are you online? I am here. I've got a question for you. I received something. I don't know if it's because of my proximity to the uh, Metro, the bank, the new bank. I received something that says that uh, there was a, a Zoning Board of Appeals, public hearing via Zoom, uh, in lieu of a meeting with the select board, uh, Barlow signs asking for signage on Ash Street. May I ask just how come that didn't come to CPDC? So there is a variance application for the number of signs at the site um, since been decided they can have a second wall sign by right. So now I'm just figuring out the decision was just issued last week and now I have to virtually kind of either get them back to CPTC or if that finding was enough, but I was thinking towards them coming back to CPTC, but I guess, yeah, Mm. that's where that's at right now. Okay, I was just curious as to what the mechanism was Mm-hmm. and why they had gone to uh, Zoning Board of Appeals for an yeah. additional sign. Okay, great, thank you. Julie, you're on. Okay, um, so let me screen share what we sent you last week. Um, hold on a second. My computer is having issues. Okay. 
Let me try it again. Just froze on me for a second. Okay, I think that's better. Can you all see the PDF on my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, on your, your screens. So um, what we, Andrew and I went through and we took the feedback that we got from you a couple of weeks ago and we tried to incorporate as much as we heard. Um, so I'll just go through. And then we added in, uh, John Barnes sent us his proposal. So we added his in as well. So um, I don't know how you wanna do this. If you want just, me to just quickly go through everything or if you want, like as we go through, like I think John is with us tonight. Like if he wants to explain what he's thinking, um, like maybe this is fairly, this, this one right here might be fairly self-explanatory. Um, it's just an additional purpose. Um, seems, uh, you know, for you to decide if you think that's uh, something to add or not. And John looks like John has a question. So I might defer to him and see what he wants to say. Yes, John, please. Thank you. Um, if I may, and I'll try to be brief. I just want to, um, by way of introduction, uh, because I don't think we've talked about it before, just introduce the, the rationale behind all of, of my revisions here. And I I, I sent you all an email. Um, I also have some revisions for the design guidelines, which I know you're not gonna get into particularly tonight, but at this particular time uh, before town meeting, but they all, I think are tied together for the same purpose. And that is um, my, my revisions are proposed to um, strengthen and support CPDC's authority um, and ability to review specifically how proposed projects integrate with existing neighboring residential properties, particularly in terms of exterior appearance massing and scale, and further, uh, to empower CPDC um, to deny such projects where they fail um, to meet that standard. Um, I just want to mention that that philosophy is supported uh, by the state law, by the state regulations, and by your own design guidelines. Um, the current uh, CMR, Code of Mass Regulations at 760-5904, um, specifically provide that uh, that a municipality may adopt design standards to ensure the physical character of projects within the district will be complementary to nearby buildings and structures, will provide for development consistent with the character of building types, streetscape, and other community feed densely settled areas, and design standards may address the scale, proportions, and exterior appearance of buildings. Further, your design guidelines specifically provide that new development should be compatible with nearby buildings and streetscape patterns and designated to reflect the traditional New England vernacular. Uh, to design, the design of buildings should capture this varied approach to design while remaining true to historic New England form. And the, the downtown smart growth district is envisioned to complement the residential land uses in design and scale and respect existing single family, two family and three family residential uses without unduly encroaching upon them. I would also add that the, the state bylaw 40R does specifically permit a municipality to apply uh, modified standards throughout all or, or a portion of the smart growth district. And in my case, I'm suggesting specifically uh, these be provided primarily towards the residential areas. So that's the, the rationale behind um, all of my uh, proposed um, revisions. And this one, uh, I think, uh, would support that. Um, just briefly, uh, I, I wanted the the uh, the bylaw to be specifically clear that, that among the other purposes of the bylaw, it is specifically to ensure that the physical character uh, of projects will be consistent with and complementary to nearby buildings, particularly existing residential uses. Um, again, my primary motivation is to provide support and authority to the CPDC um, to engage with developers regarding their proposed designs, specifically with regard to the design of the proposal to ensure that it's compatible with and it integrates properly. Um, and if it doesn't, um, to deny it on that basis, which, which is the basis of some, some of my others. But I just wanted you to have that background for the rationale. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I guess I, I don't agree with the part where it says we'll be consistent with. I'm okay with the complementary part, although to be honest with you, if somebody were putting a building up next to the, the building that's being proposed, uh, or Shoot Street, right, the, the, the existing mm -hmm. building, which is probably the ugliest building in Reading, uh, I wouldn't want it to be compatible with that. I wouldn't right. want it to complement that or even replicate that. So 
that's what I don't want. And not every building merits uh, merits respect for its design, but it certainly merits um, addressing the you know mitigating factors of the new development. So setbacks, uh, uh, privacy, those kind of things are important, but you know, I don't need to copy some ugly house that came up just because it's a house. We don't want to mimic the apartments across from, uh, I can't even remember the name of the streets, Green Street, is it Green Street? Oh, oh, the blocks, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're important <laughs> because they provide they provide housing for people. That, that's actually some of the more affordable housing probably in town, but, mm -hmm. um, but certainly we don't need to copy that again. Right. I'm not suggesting it be copied. I'm simply suggesting that they, they appear compatible. And I realize, Nick, that, that that does include some degree of subjectivity, but I think part of the responsibility of the CPDC members is to engage in a discussion about what is or is not compatible with the existing yep. I'm uh, good buildings. with all of that. Yep. I just don't like the word consistent with. I, I, if you want to change complementary to compatible, uh, compatibility is is a dialogue, I guess, that would work. But consistent with seems to me to re represent replication. OK, with all due respect, I, I don't um, I, I wanted to bring these to your attention. I don't particularly want to want to engage in a in a um, uh, in a dialogue with you, you know, to come up with the right words. I wanted to give you the ideas and then uh, respecting your, sure, your sure. authority to have you guys and women do that. So I'll, I'll beg off for now. All right, just highlight it and we can work on that. But I, I like the idea. I just, I just wanted to make you understand where I was getting stuck. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, um, so I'll just keep going. Keep going. You, you can still hear me, okay. Um, so let me just see what the next one is. So as we discussed, it seemed like a majority of CPDC wanted us to keep the lot coverage definition the same as it is in section two of the zoning bylaw, which means that it does not include other paved areas. It just includes buildings and structures. Um, and then Andrew and I reworked a little bit the definitions here, civic space. We, we actually um, looked into, like, I think Heather had mentioned the word civic here instead of public. And we looked into, into what civic versus public means. And we thought civic might be exactly what Heather <coughs> was trying to get at. Because um, public um, might make think pe people think it's a town-owned space, but civic is more just like a way to describe space that's open to the public, but doesn't have to be publicly owned. Um, I don't know if that's if that's what kind of what you were trying to if you were aiming for that Heather or not, but um, that that is what I had in mind, and I'm realizing that you know my 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 red flag at public space is probably because in my in my work life I spend so much time thinking about public lands versus non-public lands, but that is exactly what I was thinking about. And then Pam had provided some input to us over email about how open space and green space are defined by the EPA. Um, and they seem to jive in some ways with what we have here. Um, and then one question like Andrew and I are kind of going back and forth on is, and maybe it's more for discussion later, but like if we were to require a certain amount of, of these open space things and have some of them be required to be public, like how would um, like an outdoor dining space like Bun Ratty's, like I guess we would just want to be clear about how we would interpret that, like where how that would apply or how these definitions would apply to that, so we would know how to correctly account for it because it's like privately owned, and it's like visible by the public and it's not necessarily accessible to the public without like actually like paying to patronize their their business though. So seems like it could fit into a couple of different categories or not. Um, so that's just something to talk about just so that we're making sure we're interpreting it correctly and then we might wanna add language so it's really clear how that fits into these definitions. Um, if anyone has thoughts on that now or we can keep going, whatever you want. All right, um, for the question for outdoor dining like Bunratty, 
Right. So long as it's as it is open, and I don't want to say open to the public, but for example, Bun Ratties is an open area. You walk by it, it's an open area. Uh, light shines through, you get the breeze. So that would be count, that I would say counts. Uh, if they put it behind a wall and it's really, it may be open out there, outdoor area for them, but nobody ever sees it and it doesn't give you that, um, I'll call it vastness of area, then I wouldn't count that. So you're saying you, like the way it is currently, like using the Bun Rowdy example, you would count it towards the civic space? Yes especially where it's got the walkway by it. So it's really, you're not feeling closed in. It's hard to, to use words to describe, but you stand, when you stand next to it, it feels open. I may not be allowed to go there, but at least there's an opening. You may even have it within that paragraph or where, you, where it mentions including streetscape features. I mean, sidewalk front dining or how Bun Ratties is right there on the street. So isn't that right? We, I, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, it, it's it's there, it's visible from the street. This is a tough one. It's a very good question. Um, and, I, and I think Tony's getting at something where it's like, if it becomes essentially part of kind of the liveliness of the street, then maybe it fits. So to me, right, there's two, because, uh, um, there are two different spaces there, right? And, and there is some, to me, there's some private amenity space, which is the, the deck, the patio, I should say. And then there's the sidewalk with all the landscaping, right? And that would be, you know, that is, to me, it's clearly that civic, that civic space, or you could even cut it down even more where there's only the sidewalk is civic space and then the landscaping is green space. I don't know. I'm not sure it matters because really what matters more is how this is incorporated into what percentages, you know, of, of, you know, how we use this to me matters more than if we define it a hundred percent correctly. Right. Cause these are all guidances, right. To, you know, everything's negotiable. This is setting expectations. Yeah. So okay. If something, right, if they start to define it as green space and we're like, no, 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 that's not really, look, you're, com you're completely controlling it. It's, that's just private for your own people. Like we have the last, or CPDC has the last call on that, right? So if it, if it feels private, it is, to, then it, it is private, I guess, but the bigger issue is how does this, how do these definitions fit into whatever sort of regulations we're putting in? Right, and I guess the reason I was, we were trying to figure out, like the reason we were thinking it would matter is if we did put like certain amounts have to be civic or certain amounts have to be green, then like we would almost need to know like what category we're putting things in. But I guess that, you know, you could always, like you said, like work that out with the developer during the process. Um, so if, if there's something like sort of in a gray area that's like not entirely clear. Um, okay. Keep going. Okay, here's another um, John uh, addition and it's transitional area, which is defined in the design guidelines. And then John made a couple adjustments to the definition, which are shown here, crossed out. And then um, I highlighted the Cross out in italics, but I highlighted the italicized part so it would stick out for everybody to see it more clearly. Um, I don't know. If I may, sure. Well, I, if before Jonathan, before you before you chime in here, I, I guess I have one question, so that we're clear about sort of what this change does. Because I, I went on Google Earth and started measuring, and and then saw that Julie, that you had um, staff put together. A, a map and I uh, um, of what properties are within 150 feet of a of a lot containing single two and three family and I wanted to make sure that I was reading that map correctly. Um, 
And I don't know if that's something that you can bring up. And 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 Jonathan, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, right, just so that we know what properties we're talking about um, before we get into any, sort of any details. I think Absolutely. that would be helpful. No problem, John. Thank you. All right. Andrew, where did you save that map? Sorry, I'm pulling it up right now. It's in the same folder as our approved 40R spreadsheet. Um, oh, OK. Yeah, so Andrew created it, and, and Andrew and I talked about it earlier today. And Andrew, you can do you want me to try to explain it and pull it up, or do you want to do it? Um, yeah, sure. And I'll answer any questions. It's not a overly complicated or detailed map. Are you pulling it up or am I supposed to? Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> I <thought you> were. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't sure. I uh, hear, yeah, I, I'll pull it up. Fine. Okay. Um, sorry, everybody. We're, <laughs> we'll get there. I do want to thank you all for, for indulging me and allow, allowing me the opportunity to present these to you and for your consideration. Thank you. I think I found it, All right? Okay, so um, you can all see, let me just make it a little smaller, maybe. Is that, can you all see it? You can scroll down yeah. a little bit. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that so looks good. One, so basically like, the orange outline here is the downtown smart growth district. The red, sorry, or the pink are all the like single family, two family and three families that are like either in the district or like within 150 feet of the district. And so we put like this gray buffer around the district is the 150 foot buffer around the district. Um, it was a little easier to represent it this way versus putting a buffer around all of the parcels individually. So like what John's proposing is that each of these single two or three family properties would have a 150 foot buffer around it, right? And then any development that was proposed that was within that buffer or touched that buffer would have to have different setbacks or step backs. I think that's what John's saying. Um, and so we, we did this really quickly. We didn't put a buffer around each parcel because it would be really hard to read. So we buffered the outside to figure out what 150 feet looks like, which gives you kind of an idea of what a buffer, if you put a buffer around these which are in the district, like what that would look like. Um, we can refine this, but so, just give you an idea. Yeah, so this was actually perfect. And thanks for that explanation, because I, uh, uh, when I looked at it on, on Google Earth, you know, the, the, what I had uh, thought I had figured out was that really the only properties that are not within 150 feet of a, a residential um, uh, unit is like CVS and yeah, yeah, those couple of properties um, right up there in that in that area. And I, I still with this map, think that's probably um, that this map probably confirms that once you do all those, you know, all those calculations. So I, I, I want to make sure that we understand Jonathan, as you go through your, 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 your comments that essentially the transition area is the entire downtown smart growth district. And I, I, I question my question to Julie, before we sort of get going on, on this stuff is that, is that would, um, would, uh, on, on changes made to this, um, would, uh, well, I, I'll put it this way. I understand that in the past that, um, that, um, the state has asked us to provide some information where we're when we're looking at sort of buffers or that sort of thing, so they can understand of which properties they're talking about um, when we do that. So we're not like whatever spot zoning kind of a thing, um, and so that they would understand that these transitional 
rules would apply to all but those couple of properties as well. And that would be how they would assess it. So. Thank you. May I? It, it, sure. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that point and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you raised it because that, uh, Julie, it was absolutely not my intention or desire to uh, uniformly place that kind of buffer around this transitional area. Again, and, and I may have not done this um, as artfully as I, as I should have, but again, my primary purpose is to empower the CPDC and to make it clear to developers proposing to develop within this area that CPDC will be exercising its authority to address the physical character of the buildings they are proposing and the design of those uh, those buildings they are imposing uh, they are proposing and it was not intended to be an absolute uh, buffer at all in fact all it was intended to be um, was a device to enable CPDC to engage in uh, uh, negotiation or discussion when discussing uh, the design and the physical character of these of these buildings to have some authority to negotiate with developers to to change their designs if they if you find that their designs do not sufficiently integrate with or complement the existing uh, residential properties to change their design so that they do and that if they do change their designs uh, to accommodate your authority in, in exercising uh, your control over the design, if they do, then the, then the setbacks and the stepbacks and the height will be as, exactly as you indicate in the, uh, in the dimensional um, chart. But if they don't, this gives you the latitude to, to work with them to continue to rejigger their designs to get them to be more compatible and more consistent. And alternatively, they understand that if they don't, when they read this, and it comes up not here in the definition, but in the dimensional control uh, graph, that you will have the authority to, to push them to change their design. And they will understand that if they don't uh, meet your, your authority with respect to the design, that they may run the risk that the the setback and the step back may be increased uh, up to, not automatically at that figure. It was more or less a tool to, to give you the authority to, to push them with respect to your uh, desires for the design. That, that, that's the purpose. And the reason I, I, I'm changing it, by the way, John, um, I, 150 uh, feet is simply a, a placeholder. And I leave that again up to, to you to figure out, to be honest with you. I originally, when I wrote it, I originally had it at uh, 300 feet, but I realized immediately that I should change that or I would likely be uh, permanently muted at CBDC meetings. So <laughs> the number is just a, a number for you to work with. But the, the purpose for it is this, and I'll, I'll give you the example to, 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 to uh, demonstrate. The Chronicle building. Um, is on uh, obviously on Main Street, but uh, that's Chapin Ave, I think. Um, and in the area uh, behind uh, the Chronicle building, on both sides of the street, uh, on the Mission of Deeds side as well as theirs, is an entire residential community, um, uh, residential properties. Um, however, the way it's currently worded, uh, and this is the case in, uh, for my changes in the design guidelines as well. Um, the language that currently exists is, is usually directly abutting or always directly abutting. And in the case, for example, of, um, of uh, the Chronicle building, the directly abutting property is an auto parts building. Uh, it, it happens to be a very small building um, and it's almost uh, not even visible, but what is visible is the house immediately behind that and the house behind that. So my point is that leaving it as directly abutting, I think is, is woefully inadequate to address the, the, the valid concerns of residential properties that will be looking at these projects every day for the rest of their ownership of those properties. Um, and I don't think it's fair to have it only be the directly abutting property. And that's why I, I wanted to come up with some other uh, definition. I came up with 150 feet. Um, I don't know what's necessarily appropriate. I just didn't I didn't think it was appropriate to have it be limited to the directly abutting property. And I, we can talk more about 
the philo philosophical concept when you get into 10, 5, 6, which is the dimensional and other requirements, the, uh, the uh, graph, the chart. Thank you for that explanation. Julie, can we continue? I'm just going to make a note about yep. what he said. Um, pardon me, typos. Okay. Um, Two T's and a button. Right. So here we are at the dimensional table um, and we have another map actually we can show that looks at the 6,000 square foot um, and less lots. And then like a um, spreadsheet Andrew put together that kind of breaks down like what the uses are and um, what the impact of like having a minimum lot area might be. Um, and then one thing that I just noted that we didn't really discuss last time was Tony's suggestion about the the two setbacks combined at 30 feet. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really talk about that in great detail, so I left that in. Um, and then I did note, a, note some areas in the design guidelines. I think maybe I put this in last time um, in relation to this the comment about the 300 feet of maximum building frontage. Um, some parts of the design guidelines that actually give the CPDC like leverage and authority to get some variation in the facades, um, if that's helpful. And then again, I added in um, some of John's, John's proposal for how that transitional area would be applied or how the setbacks and setbacks would be applied to um, buildings within that tra transitional area. So we can, which, which one do you want to start with? Um, I think setbacks, that's the hot topic. Okay. Um, so not to put you on the spot, Tony, but sort of the theme of the night. Do you want to talk about the your idea here? Um, well, reading um, Burlington Zoning Board of Appeals notices because what else am I going to do on a Friday night? Uh, but I noticed that their zoning allows for the combination of setbacks so that you have to have, call it 30 feet on at least two sides. So it could be 2010, it could be 30 on one, it could be 15, 15. That uh, idea appealed to me in that it allowed the developer the ability to adjust the building to that maximizes their ability to, to do what they need to while still requiring at least some sort of open space. It also worked well with residential in that if you said, okay, I need at least 10 feet on the two sides in the rear for combined 30 feet, they could put all that 30 feet if they were abutting a residential and go to the edges of the lot. Or they could put it in a corner which would give them more uh, green space to use on the side of a building, as opposed to two little thin strips, you could have a slightly, well, twice as much space. So that was my thought process. What the number should be, that's a question for the board. So it's similar to what we had proposed here, which is two setbacks and uh, like a 20 feet, right? If you add them together. And right. but yours is three setbacks and 30 feet. Yes. So fair to say. Um, or are, are you also saying that it could be one setback? It could be interpreted as one setback with 20 feet. Which one, Katrina? The one that's written here or Tony's? Yeah. If we apply Tony's theme to what's written here. Oh, I see what you mean. Right. right. Good catch. Um, yeah, I don't know. What does everybody think?
I, I like the idea of um, combining setbacks. Um, and then Tony, what you're proposing is that we, we bump that up from 20 to basically 20 as written, which 10 feet each times two to 30, or were you being agnostic on the, on the amount? I'm agnostic on the amount, but I figure 10 feet on each side in the rear minimum to give you a 30 total provides more uh, flexibility and at least an alleyway between buildings. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't understand how that reads. That was my question. Right now it says minimum of two setbacks is 10 feet each. That's not what you're trying to say there, right? So I'm saying what, what we were saying here is that at a minimum, two setbacks need to be 10 feet each. So that you could do three, but you get to, the point is that you, you, a developer would get to choose what makes sense for their project based on what their abutting uses are and what their lot layout looks like, um, whether it's a front, a rear, or a side, whether they're adjacent to each other or it's the front and the rear or the two sides. Um, But, you know, I Katrina pointed out that, like, what if it were one setback that was 20 feet? What if that scenario made sense in, for some properties? Maybe it would. Yeah, that was my interpretation of what Tony was saying, mm -hmm. which, which no, I think I, I like. I like the idea of allowing that flexibility. Katrina, the only place you saw that? Uh, I saw it in the Burlington Zoning Board of Appeals that they have uh, combined setbacks on the sides of 15 feet. So if they're having a combination, does that mean that they build right up to the property line on the other side? They could. Hmm. And it may make sense to do that. So, for example, Gould Street could have taken all of their 30 feet of required setback and put it against the back to distance itself more from the residential. I still don't like the way this reads. Yeah, and then yeah. I guess I'd like to find out from town council whether that's allowed. It just seems like a really weird, mm. uh, like a variable that I, I don't understand. Code. Right. What do you mean, Nick? Um, it's like saying, it's almost like saying um, setback will be determined by CPDC. You know, mm. it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. so vague that it's never be allowed. And so this language is just odd to me. I've never seen it like this before. That's why I asked whether we saw it anywhere else, whether it wasn't, you're saying it was the ZBA's um, standard language, not just some decision that they made for a property. It was in the notice and, it's, and it listed the uh, bylaw that they were applying for a variance of. And that was the combined setbacks of 15 feet. Okay. So do you like the idea, but you want us to work on like the wording? Um, so it's not, so that it's more clear what it is we're asking for. Yeah, it's just a few words over here somewhere yeah. that's just throwing me off. Okay, yes, I, I agree. It's not, not, it would be hard to figure out later on like what we meant. <laughs> yep, I thought Petra's gonna hate you. Uh, yeah, so we can, 
if you like the the concept of it and um and maybe just let it like let us know what you think the max or the minimum should be total the total minimum should be we can reword yeah yeah, it's like what we're actually you just said it what was on my mind is I think what we're talking about is a total minimum setback on one or more sides. Oh, I like that. And that may it's late, so that might not be the right words either, but I think it's the combined setback is the explainer is what's throwing me off. So the minimum setback on any side is zero. That's what this is saying. <laughs> That's what that says. Right? Mm -hmm. Because you could you could push it one way or the other. There's yeah. some total. But what this is saying is that overall, on at least one side of the building, we want a total of 20 feet. You could do 10 feet on two sides. This also means you could do five feet on four sides and is, um, is that what we want? Is that what we're and let's see what's confusing me here is that it seems to me like typically there are setbacks and there they are real numbers. Um, and any variation from that setback is a ZBA issue, right? It's a variance. Yep. In this bylaw, it would be a waiver, right? It would not be, it would not trip the zoning board. Okay. But I think what, like what I was trying to do with the 20 feet was capture um, the other provisions in here, right? So um, if a project was providing a 15 foot setback, right? Because they were abutting a residential zone um, that would qualify here. And then they would need to provide like, what was I doing? I don't know. <laughs> they, like it, under this 20 feet minimum, right? Then they would have five feet that they would need to put somewhere else. Um, you know, I don't know. Do, like, do you, we had set it as a 10 feet each before, I think to try to minimize like just getting a strip a five foot strip around the building on all sides which may not really amount to much um but but maybe having this flexibility is beneficial are you pardon me are you guys allowing public comment at this point Yell louder, Pam. Yeah. Pam, you're on mute. Yell louder. I I'm figured muting. David, David can hear. Open uh, your window. Sorry. Uh, not until we finish the board's discussion. Oh, okay, because Jonathan Barnes had been discussing a lot before, and he's a member of the public, so that, I was, that's why I was confused. But he had given us input specifically for these gu guidelines. Oh, okay, <clears> so, <throat> so did we, but that's okay. I'll, I'll sit tight. Thank you. Go ahead, Julie. Um, I think I was just, I put it back to you guys. Like, what do we, it does this achieve what we were, I, I remember last time you, you guys seemed like you liked the, the idea of the way it was worded and then Nick had the same comment he had this time, which I didn't really fully understand until today. Um, so does changing it in the way we've changed it make it more aligned with what you want or like are we deviating from what, what the goal is here? Well, I guess the question becomes what is the goal? Um, my thought was that the goal was to have some setbacks to free up some open space as opposed to having a project that's built out to every edge. Well, we have, we had minimum setbacks, didn't we, in some locations. So uh, if you want the ability to move the building around on the site so that you have um, a way to address impact to an adjacent property, right, to, to 
minimize the impact of this new building on the existing building, residential building potentially, or if you want the ability to create more open space, there's an open space adjacent to it. So you push the building opposite and you get double the open space. We started talking about how to combine them. If you want that, then this approach will work. But we're going to have to really be cognizant of potential zero setback somewhere or a five foot setback, you know, to try it. what the impact of that is on that side if we're trying to increase the, the setback on the other side. That's all. And that was my concern too. You're you're going to end up with a zero setback, not just in the front, but pretty close to another building. Yeah, but it may not matter, right? So, for example, if we're talking about the building on the corner of of Haven and uh, Lincoln, Lincoln. Yes. No, Lincoln's on the other side, right? Yep. Do you have the Haven side tracks? High, high, high Street. Yeah. Right. If that were zero on Lincoln and on High Street, it wouldn't matter, right? Because there's nothing else there. Mm -hmm. So some some special edge, some condition that says, you know, a zero setback doesn't matter. This is a, a, a wooded area that doesn't, that, you know, you're outside the wetland boundary or anything like that, but I don't know if I have wetlands, but you know what I mean? So sometimes yeah. a zero setback might make sense because then we're getting this, all this extra space on the other side where we could use it for open space or to protect a, a property then this approach works and just have to make sure that we have the right wording for it that's all okay and and uh, i don't know about not taking public comment but um we're already really late i'm not sure we're going to get to any public comments if we keep going like this oh i know i'm not sure if we if we could keep everything brief and moving i'd be willing to listen i could certainly be brief Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dave Talbot, 75 Linden. Um, it just This is a great conversation. Don't want to slow it down. The That was one of the driving ideas behind having maximum lot coverage at something. Then you could move the building around and have um, you know that X percent, whether it's 15 or 20, to play with on any side. That's, that's kind of where we were coming from. So something, maybe that's a way to do this. Um, the other, the other point, important point I wanted to say was having minimum um, open space. And I like the definitions that you came up with, with the civic and the green, but that if you include a definition that has to be one of those two things in here, then you have yet another tool to create that space that people have been seeking. So the thought we'd had was a 10% would be, you know, a reasonable number for that. So those are just two things I wanted to bring in on, on this discussion and that and that that should not include the private amenity space to uh, to Tony's point earlier if they have some courtyard that that doesn't count with the 10%. So I would I would suggest putting a percentage of the minimum open meaning civic and green and maybe a minimum lot coverage, although I took Nick's point from um, last meeting that you end up with a little bit but if you anyway those those are my feedbacks on this particular um, spot. Um, if I don't get a chance later, the big one I think we had was uh, that our comments are now in a totally different document that's been called the slow growth proposal. And we were confused about who came up with that moniker for earlier sets of feedback and why there's a separate document that's called the slow growth proposal. It's not really where we're coming from. It's all in the same spirit of what you all have been talking about. But there are things in there that you're not reviewing in this document. So maybe it's another meeting when some of those things are gonna get looked at again, or does it mean you've rejected them? It's not really clear. Um, the other thing that's been changed is you have tier two now is 25 to 65 units, which came sort of emerged tonight. We didn't see that discussed at all last week. It was, I mean, last time it was 20 to 40 was tier one, 40 to 60 was tier two, and then above 60 was tier three. I think those tiers are the right ones. And, and I think based also on the discussion from Shoot Street, capping it, everything at 60 would solve a lot of your problems and the struggles that you're having with Shoot Street. If, if it was a cap at 60, mm -hmm. then a lot of this goes away. So that's, that's, that's it. I tried to be as brief as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Good discussion, by the way. Thank you. No problem. Julie, I think we can continue. Okay. Um, so do you want us to show you the impact of, well, yes, I guess, do we, does, 
a majority of you agree that like a 20, 20 feet here is, is, is that this adding this provision in is a good, good idea and that 20 feet is the right number. I mean, it's 20 like feet minimum. It. And as I said, I'd go for 30, but I can live I'd with I'd go 20. for 30. <clears throat> I agree, 30. So my thought uh, is that I agree 20 feet is the minimum. It seems like, you know, we, we, we get proposals that are, you know, at the, at the minimum, not generally not mm -hmm. more. Um, so I guess that means I I could be I could go to thirty um, I could go to thirty. Thirty sounds good to me. Okay. Good. Setbacks further down. All right. So um, I will. Just give me one second. I'll screen share the map that shows impacts of 6,000 square foot minimum lot area. And we can talk about that. So um, if we increase the minimum lot area of 6,000 square feet, the, again, like the green, the orange outline is the downtown Spark Oak district. And then the blue parcels are the parcels that are 6,000 square feet and less. Um, and uh, Andrew had done an analysis. Let me see, I think it's right. Yeah, what I couldn't do just due to time was determine how many are not developable currently for the frontage requirements, but we were at least able to pull some numbers that the 67 out of 140 downtown parcels are actually 6,000 square feet or smaller. Um, of those 67 parcels, 28 or 42% are single two and three family for what that means, whatever that means seven are municipally owned and um, two or four plus residential unit developments. So again, I wish I had the time to pull out the frontage to see how many are developable or not already. I just didn't have the time today. Well, this is good work. So, yeah. A number of them are currently don't have 50 feet of frontage. And so like, wouldn't be in theory, like developable under the 40 hour overlay district already, right. um, unless yep. they were combined. Right. And that, so a spreadsheet showing like that impact is something that we will have to submit to DHCD along with probably all sorts of other analysis because that typically how that's how it works. So. Mm -hmm. Um, when we'll submit the zoning amendment and then in the upcoming months, we'll have to give them like all the information about how the zoning amendments will impact um, the ability for a by right density of densities of 20 units per acre on these lots. Um, and then they'll assess like whether they, they want to allow us to make the zoning changes or not. Um, okay. And if we need to pay them back for any any money they gave us. So we will be putting together like a lot of a lot of data. Um, this is just the start. What money we got? I thought we, I thought we only got money when we permitted units. So we got money originally. We got a zoning incentive payment um, when we established the district. And they, they look at like basically what your what your current underlying zoning allows in terms of um, uh, multifamily or residential units and then what under a 20 unit per acre scenario, um, your like additional zoned units that you could get. And then they figure out some, there's like different thresholds and the, then they figure out like which threshold you're in and how much money they'll pay the town. Um, and so if we do anything to impact that, there's a chance we could owe them back money. Um, 
like the money's not really the reason we did it or a reason to not change it, but it's just a fact of fact of what we're dealing with. Right. Well, we can't decide on that final right. until we know what that number is, because a lot of these might just drop off with that 50 foot frontage. Mm -hmm. What I guess <clears throat> what would also be interesting um, is what about just the forget about the 6,000, like how many parcels um, fall off because of the 50 foot um, requirement anyhow? Right. That's a that's a piece of information we're still working to get. We just ran out of time. And 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 I guess the the other thing that sort of jumps out at me is right because so many of these parcels are small, right? And mm -hmm. it's hard to know what 50 feet is, but I'm assuming that many right many of those parcels on Green Street don't have 50 feet of frontage, right? Right. It's correct. So, um, just a handful of us. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm only, I'm only saying that because I, right, just as a, as a, as a, you know, as a uh, measuring um, comparison, I guess, Julie, the other thing <laughs> that would just be, I, I guess, super interesting to me is like, w w how many parcels are we really talking about here? Like, we spend all these hours 30. in like, if we separate, if we take out all the municipal owned properties, all the properties that are, um, that have the, that don't have the 50 foot frontage, and uh, I don't know, all the properties that have been redeveloped in the past, you know, I don't know, 20 years, you know, right? If it's been redeveloped, I don't know what the right number is there, but right, it just seems like if it's been redeveloped in the past 20 years, they're not knocking it down and, and redeveloping. Maybe it's longer than that probably longer than that, but like, how many parcels do we have left? And are we killing ourselves for like, yep. you know, six parcels? I don't know. It just, I, it would be good to know. Yeah, we can, uh, that's not that. Sorry, difficult. I don't mean to be cynical. No, it's not that. <laughs> but it's late. Late. <laughs> I think about that a lot too, especially as, as it gets really late into the evening. Um, I think, I mean, that's not a, not a difficult thing for us to, to figure no, out. No, I didn't think so. Yeah. Right, and because I, mix mixed in here is a lot of also like the bigger parcels here that I'm viewing are either developed or or town owned. Yeah. Right. Aside from a couple of key ones, you right. know. So that might actually help us sort of understand what you know what how to tailor this. Yeah. That can do that. Okay. So let me just go back to where where I was, and then um, like, do you feel like six thousand square feet is a good minimum lot area based on what the the limited imperfect information we've given you? Yes. I'd say ignore it. As we've seen, the lots really don't matter that much. Most. The ones that are less than 6,000 square feet probably don't have the 50 foot. You're really not gonna limit, uh, eliminate a lot of construction that way. I, I think it, I think without the 50 foot piece, it's sort of hard to say. Like without understanding how many fall away. Right, yes. Okay, all right. Um, okay. Andrew, is that something you can try to figure out? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. I can definitely do that this week. Well, no, I mean right now. Oh, right oh. now. <laughs> I'm going to guess five. All right. So I know, like, you know, just look on the GIS. Um, so basically, you know, tonight's the night. This has to go to DHCD and town council like this week. So yep. we don't have a lot of time to figure this out beyond Got tonight. It. So if do you want, want us to proceed while yeah, Andrew right, so finishes that up and we then can we can circle come back, back to that like in a couple hours we'll circle back to that. Okay. Yeah, we'll well, that hours. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um we'll at least get like a rough idea if it's not if it's not perfect. We'll get it. Um all right. So Okay. Uh, I don't know if we should have John talk about his information here or if we should keep going. 
That's up just to one you. minute. Yes. Thanks. Just really quickly, this is the section that applies uh, the the definition of transitional area, and as you can see, um, it's not automatically placing that um, those larger figures on it, but it's leaving it in your discretion. The whole idea here is that um, it's again, it's empowering you, the CPDC, to engage in in a discussion with a developer regarding particularly the design um, and where and where the design, uh, in your opinion fails to integrate with or complement the character of nearby residences, you have the discretion to increase it. It doesn't say you must, and it doesn't say you should, but it just leaves it up to you. If, it, if you have ideas about a design and a developer is willing to meet part of that, but not all of it, you have the latitude to sort of say, well, you know, that that's gonna, that may result in our increasing the, uh, the setback or the step back or uh, re uh, reducing the height. It just gives you the ability to bargain Concerning your um, your your thoughts about uh, the the adequacy or inadequacy of the de the design of the project and the degree to which it it integrates with uh, the existing residential properties. Thank you. Okay. I should add, it's, it's the same principle in 10562, which, which does the same thing to the height, um, it's, it's, which is on the next page, which you'll see in a second, but it's the same concept. Thank you, right there. Oh, no, not right there. Yeah. Yes, right there. Thank you. And you may want to consider applying these principles, even if you don't increase the the uh, area of the of the definition of a transitional area, if you keep it as abutting residential properties, you still could give yourselves this this uh, this authority to uh, to negotiate with a developer uh, uh, regarding the design of the project. These three paragraphs have the same language as that first. Yep. And so if we're gonna change the wording of that last piece there, it should be consistent in all three. Yep. I'll just highlight it for now. Yeah. Um, are there any comments or concerns with this? I know in the Gould Street project, we had a lot of problem with the step back, what they call the step back. <clears throat> They pretty much built up to the property line. And then in the upper floors, they shifted the mass of it towards the Gould Street. So it has the appearance that it's not close to the abutter. But in fact, they're right up against that line, the property line. So I think we need to talk about what this step back really means in terms of its impact on its neighbors. And Pam, it sounds like what you're, at, you're suggesting we consider is the way that the combination of step back would be used with a setback or lack thereof. Right. And what I'm what I'm seeing here in this suggestion is uh, explicitly giving us put it, the grounding to negotiate greater setbacks or step backs depending on the situation relative to yep. abutting properties. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. that a, a step back only works if there's still some breathing room on that property line. Well, the so, step back is from the building face, not from the property line. The step back is from the property line. The, so step, the, first, the step back. Step backs are for the upper stories where you, right. you start to move but the they building built, face. Back. But they built right up on the property line. Well, I on think the back you, on Gould the Street, the, the back of the building is three feet off the property line, I think. 
right? They pushed it back three feet. So the step back is further back than that. So it can't be on the property line. Now it may not have been sufficient to the to the people who live there, but you know, it's it's not on the property line. Um, I'm just concerned about how vast these two these statements are, and I'm wondering if DHCD would push back on them. That's all. Mm -hmm. I think I, it's. I don't want as much leeway as we can have. Yeah. I just don't know if they'll go for it. I think it's possible, you know, so anything we put in this dimensional table here would apply to all projects, right? Not so including like the buy right 20 unit per acre project, not just the ones seeking waivers. And that's what DHCV is going to look at. Like, what are, are we still able to get 20 units per acre on these lots? And so they might push back on all of these, all of the things we're putting in, in here. Mm. Got it. And these zoning amendments aren't aren't final and aren't applicable to any projects until they're approved by the Department of Housing and Community Development. So that's just a, understood. The the line we're trying to walk, right? Mm. Go on. All right. Yep. I was just putting my two cents in. Do you want to talk about the one that relates to height? Uh, I, can I just take us back on, on that note, Julie? Can I just take us back to a little bit to the the thirty foot setback? And um, you know, if they're right, if if they're focusing on that, so right, oftentimes they're the, especially after looking at the map, right? The, the setback um, is not uniform. Well, we're sort of saying that the setback shouldn't necessarily be uniform, but are we saying that the setback has to be uniform across the property line? And so, right, this, to me, this introduces this complex situation where, they're, where they may say, and maybe this is okay, like, oh, on this side, I'm gonna have you know, a 10 foot setback and over it, but then on a little further down the property line, I'm gonna have a 30 foot setback. And then over here, like, are we, are we okay with that? And that if it all just adds up to 30, I guess that's the one thing that I have. And I can see DHCD sort of that just popping their head off when they try and figure that out. Yeah, I thought the minimum would be the minimum. And then if they pushed in or out, they would never exceed the minimum, right? So if we, if you normally have a 10 foot setback and you're on that 10 foot line, you could have a part of the building dance in you know, 20 feet away, it doesn't matter. So I was thinking that we told them they have to have a minimum. It could be yeah. greater than the minimum if their building mass addresses uh, that. But along that, along that, Side, along that um, along that one line there would be the num one, one number applied to it whether you were on it or more than it does it make sense so an h yeah, yeah. an h shaped building doesn't get credit yeah. for the part that goes deep it only gets credit right. for being on the line okay Okay, so this section, um, we modified it a little bit since what you talked about last time because we realized we were using different terminology in this paragraph about um, like gross floor area than we were than we're using below in the waiver section related to commercial um, portions of a project and, and gross floor area. So we want to keep them the same. And then, um, so I adjusted this slightly to try to um, I'm trying to remember exactly. I think like up here we had, um, you had suggested 12.5% of the development project's total gross floor area, which we were like thinking could be like one eighth of the building, right? Like, and maybe the front half of the, the bottom floor, right? Um, and then down below, we started talking about um, percentages of just that ground floor. So 
we realize we might be asking for more here and less there in some cases, or it just is, it gets a, it gets a little complicated to figure out. So um, what I did is I reduced this to 10 and then down below bumped them up and just talked about the talked about the the gross floor area, not the ground floor area. Um, I don't know if that's something that you want, but I thought we should at least be consistent however we decide to do it. Um, so I don't know if I should just skip down to that now. Or... No, why don't you? Okay. So it's in this, these waiver, um, this tiered schedule. Um, let me see. So commercial, like in this first tier, we said 12.5% of total gross floor area of the building. So consistent language with above, and then just a slightly higher requirement. And then um, in this one, bumped it to 15%. And then in tier three, I think, I forget what we put it at, uh, 25%. So it's like building gross floor area instead of just that bottom, that ground floor. Um, and so in, in a sense, like I think before we had 100% of the ground floor and here we have 25% of the total gross floor area, which could end up being close to 100% of that ground floor. Um, if it's a four story building, right? Should I go back? Yes. I will say I was getting uh, confused. I'm going 10% of the ground floor. That's almost no, then I realized yeah. of all four floors. So, mm -hmm. and technically it could be 40% at that of the ground floor. If you look at it that way. Am I doing the math right? Yep. Yeah, so we took ground floor out of it because like ground floor is also complicated by the fact that we have buildings with grade change. We have buildings, you know, like Postmark, which have commercial on different levels, um, the shoot street proposals talking about second floor. So um, we just thought it would be better to talk about it in terms of gross floor area, given flexibility on where it goes. Um, Sound good? Yes. And then the um, parking conversation, we also didn't have really that last time. Let me just, um, yeah, so I left, Tony had a comment about the parking ex exemption um, and we didn't talk about that last time. So I'll try and be very brief. Uh, basically, I think the 300, uh, foot limit for off street parking was to save buildings that were built before we had cars and any new building that goes up or a significant renovation of an older building with an uh, expansion really should be able to start providing for some, at least some of the parking that they're going to require. So my concern with that is what's the difference between that and then trying to build, you know, like a strip mall in downtown 
I mean, that's a reason why strip malls look like strip malls is because they try and accommodate all the, the parking on site or are required to accommodate parking on site and why downtowns are downtowns is because they pool parking. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm into this um, because then the only parking, the only sites that could be developed would be, um, I mean, none, right? We won't get, we won't get retail any more retail um, downtown. Except that they are building parking right now. They're building it for the residential. Yep. So if you start bringing down, if you start having some parking requirements for the businesses, but, it just means that they're not going to be able to go up to, you know, 75, 80 units per acre. But I don't but think that that's going to work either because you gotta, the, Go I guess here's a premise, right? And and maybe I'm completely wrong on this, but no one's making money on their retail developments, right? Um, and so the 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 and and I don't care whether they do or not, right? But I do want the retail development. Um, and so when you require that and then you dedicate some parking, right, that takes away from the ability for them to recoup their costs on the, um, on the residential, on the market rate residential. And so each time we do this, right, there's, there's less and less likelihood that any right any of these buildings work because our our uh, uh, if we had lots of if we had lots of space like lexington or you know where you have big lots yes but we have these tiny little lots i mean you, you just saw you saw that map and so I, I my concern over this right we've talked through a lot of stuff here is dedicating more space to all of this stuff which is all good but then taken in total like, I, I think this one in particular, right? I mean, we're setting ourselves up for a different kind of development that doesn't, is not consistent with downtown, um, with a downtown area, being at downtown Reading or somewhere else. And also, if you look at the push for increasing the 1.25 number, if you took that Shoot Street project, for example, and took it down to 25 units, but you increased the ratio to 1.5, that only that gets you 37 spots. So you only have two available for the retail. So there's vying, there's some vying interests here. People are pushing for more parking for the residential part, less, less residential, but the parking number stays the same. You still don't have room on site for any commercial parking. I agree with with what's been said. I think that if there is a, a, a felt need and observable need for um, more parking to serve commercial uses, it should be on like a shared basis or a public parking basis so that we can, um, you know, leverage the public lots and shared sharing between uses that have different peak times and the things that make a downtown um, different than a shopping mall. Um, so I think that there, if there's a felt need around this, it, 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 it should be addressed in a shared and public parking way, um, instead. My thought process was that we could waive parking, um, as we do for loading zones, we waive parking requirements, but at least let them come in proposing something, come up with a, a way that parking is actually going to work. Um, the problem is I don't want to see businesses that never open or fail because nobody can get to them because they, nobody wants to park. And I know we've got an entire committee uh, dedicated right now to trying to figure that out. But if we start saying, if, if we go and say, hey, you don't need any parking, all you're doing is exasperating the problem. That's my opinion. 
I yield to the rest of the board. I'm um, inclined to not steer development toward needing to provide additional parking for commercial and uh, as as has been said, focusing on shared parking so that it can really feel like a downtown. All right. And I, in saying that, I'm not diminishing the importance of finding shared parking solutions. You have an example of downtown where somebody, uh, where a commercial entity built uh, a parking lot for themselves and then left it empty. That didn't help anyone. You mean the Reading example? In Reading, yes. Yeah. Where's that? I can't tell you because then you'll go park there. <laughs> I'm not leaving my house. Well, you don't need to park downtown either, Pam. No, I don't. <laughs> and again, I'll say in the 27 years I've lived in Reading, I have never not found parking downtown. So I don't know what you guys are doing. Maybe I'm just really lucky, but most of the time I get within a couple of spaces of where I'm going. It's a guy thing, Mick. I'm sorry. Okay. My All dad right. had the same. I don't circle or anything like that, but I just <laughs> always find parking, so I don't know. I will say maybe I've got my mother's parking lot, lot parking luck, but that's generally my experience also. Maybe it's when, when I go. As a member of the park committee, generally the issue, um, the issue is related to employee parking. Okay. Um, right, and in the the long hours that employee parking that employees need, and sort of management of that, um, and and not generally right, Nick. I, I'm going to guess like it's not running to CVS um, uh, kind of kind of trips because I think yeah, generally yeah. that is managed pretty well. <clears throat> That's a good perspective to have. Thank you for sharing that. That's good information. Go ahead, Julie. Okay, so we didn't. We also didn't really talk about parking design, but what I did here is um, I added in some specifics from Section Nine, which is the parking section. Um, actually, I added in the language from Section Nine, and then I made it more specific um, in terms of like what to allow for compact spaces, which um, we don't really specify anywhere, and we don't really specify. Um, like dimensions and, and portions. And so what I put was up to 33% of required parking spaces may be provided as compact. I don't know if that's the right amount, but that is about what you've, you've approved in other projects downtown. Um, and I feel like maybe last time there was a comment about allowing it to be, be a little bit less of a percent, um, but I might be misremembering that. Do we have any information on, you know, on, on, on how percentages of compact spaces in, in these buildings are actually working out? It seems like we have discussion almost every time there's a project of, okay, are we forcing residents, renters or owners to then buy the compact cars? Is there any decent, reliable information on kind of, you know, what portion of residents are driving a compact car? So going at it from a, like, like the, I think we're going at it from slightly different, right, perspectives, like, but the information I have from the rental projects and ownership projects downtown um, indicates that there is not a problem, like, the, except for the problem that we all know about with Postmark. Um, but in the rental uh, projects that have compact spaces, there I have not had any complaints or heard any problems. And I got data from all the project managers and project owners about how the spaces are utilized. And I always, that was a question I asked, is 33% of comp compact spaces like too many? Is it enough? And I was told that basically it's, it's on target with what they're seeing for their renters. Um, but that doesn't, the way you were getting at it was like, maybe there were renters who are interested who had 
bigger cars and all that was left was a compact space. And so then they didn't rent there. You know, like I that part, I don't know. But. Well, right. And, it, and actually, my question really was about, you know, how is it working out? I mean, because there is there is there is that factor that I think we can't um, we can't delve too deeply into that of, you know, people will make choices about where they're going to rent, probably based on whether they have a parking space and what that's like. And I, I, I did mean, you know, how is it working out for buildings and occupancy overall? Yeah, and I do know with some of the rental projects, like they'll say that they allocate one space per per unit, right, in the rental projects, right, but they allocate them, right, and there's one that's like dedicated, but it can move depending on who moves into the building and what the needs are, yeah. um, and that's something that the management companies end up taking care of and, and, and managing as people move in and move out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've heard that it works okay and that that amount seems to be all right um, in the rental projects. Do we need to qualify it then for rental and purchase? I mean, the only project that I know that really has a problem is Postmark and even the spaces that are, you know, it's, 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 it's not necessarily the compact spaces that are problem. It's that they're striped super duper subcompact, so no car could fit there. Um, and you know, hopefully they'll come in and resolve that at some point soon. Um, so that I don't know if that's a really really good thing to to design a a bylaw around. Is that one um, outlier kind of situation that has like other factors that are making it challenging? You said they're striped, super duper compact. Um, they're, are they striped per the um, approved site plan? No. Oh, okay. Right. So if they were striped per the approved site plan and we had a problem, then yeah, maybe we would want to like think about this differently. But they're not striped per the per the approved plan. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Julie. All right. I just stopped talking, so I was giving a break to see if anyone else wanted to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going then. Yes, please do. OK. Um, so then we have this like open space design section where it's um, kind of talks about the, the goals of like what we would want open space to to be how we would want it to face interface with the public with the building um, how we want it to be known that it's meant for civic use um, and we put in some specifics regarding like civic space um, and then i didn't know if we should try to add some stuff regarding the green space or private amenity space or just if those more speak for themselves um, we maybe don't need to over-design them. Um, no. Maybe we don't need to over-design the civic space either. I, you know, I don't know. Some raised hands. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, should we entertain them that we haven't completed the board discussion? So, what, what's I'm your happy thought? to listen. Okay. Uh, Sarah Bucalaccia, go ahead. Hi, Sarah Bucalaccia, 48 Maple Ridge Road. Um, I'm just, I was hoping to get called on sooner because I wanted to have both of the documents side by side just to save time because we're going to have to go through this all again, going back to the instructional motion, the so-called slow growth document. Because? Because none of the changes that were talked about at the last meeting are on this document. They're only on the other document. I don't know why there's two documents. So, I, Julie, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm, I don't know why there's two documents, but I do know that there was discussion at one point um, of whether it made sense to have uh, two um, two 
um, articles. town meeting articles. Um, I it from a I'm going to say from a personal standpoint, not speaking for the board. Um, I think it's clear that to me at least that there are um, proposals, lots of proposals that have come up, um, you know, and that we have talked through uh, um, that, right, that come up multiple times at town meeting um, that uh, some feel pretty adamant about. And I don't think that we're in the time that we have, we're gonna be able to resolve a cohesive, um, document that addresses all of them because they're 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 not they're they're not all they can't all work together um and so you know um you know one idea and right this is just an idea to be put out to the to the board is whether we do have two um two warrant articles um one that addresses all of the items, you know, specifically that was that were identified and and as was said a number of times to this board, were robustly approved by town meeting, um, and um, and then um, a, a another Warren article that um, that has um, sort of an alternative approach in there, um, so. I, I don't know, Julie, if that's why they're in two different two different documents, but I do know that um, that I, I had mentioned that approach to Julie in the past. Yeah, so it's like it seems from the conversations that we're having that some of the ideas that are proposed or that are that some of the residents are interested in are not ideas that are going to end up in the CBDC's proposal, and so at, in an effort to like not just forget them. Um, I put them in another document and I and I wasn't sure if it would make sense for CPDC to have two articles um, and just have the other one be addressed head on at town meeting as well as this one. Um, you know, I mean, I, I guess like when I started working on this, I was hoping that there would be a way to try to like wrap some of some of the ideas and I think we have taken some of the ideas and tried to wrap them in here and we've had gotten gotten a lot of great feedback from the public on on what we're talking about but I can't I don't think that there's I don't think there's a feasible way to wrap all of their ideas into this document and have a bylaw that works and isn't just flat out rejected by DHCD um, or that would a developer would even know how to use and so I just started feeling like maybe maybe it makes sense to have them in a certain warrant article and it also seemed like some members of cpdc were leaning that way as well um you know one alternative like like that's one alternative is to have two articles um and then let town meeting pick one um and then the other another alternative is go ahead with the cpdc proposal and then residents can always make um motions to amend that proposal on the floor of town meeting and those motions get voted and so some some, some things stay and some things don't um there's also the option for a citizen petition which is um submitted pursuant to mass general law chapter 40a section 5 um you know which with with sufficient time prior to a town meeting that gets submitted either to uh the select board or directly to cpdc and then cpdc holds a hearing and and puts that article forward. So that, that's not something that we we were able to do with the either the instructional motions or the latest citizen petition, which came in, I think, pretty late, pretty close to town meeting. So there is a requirement that if if an article has a public hearing, right, before a town meeting, such as the public hearing we're in now, that public hearing has to close uh, no less than 21 days prior to the opening of town meeting. So there, and there's a whole you know time frame that's built backwards from town meeting in terms of when the warrant closes and um, and in terms of the the noticing requirements and all that. So there's a whole process outlined, Chapter 40A, Section Five, for how to submit a citizen petition and have it actually end up as a warrant article. Um, you know, so there are different ways that that this can be done, and I was just trying to figure out a way to try to accommodate 
what we've been hearing in this town meeting without it being in the specific CPDC bylaw proposal. Not I'm kind of shocked that we were talking until after midnight at the last meeting, working on um, working together on the instructional motion, um, the basis of the two instructional motions, along with um, information from the park, you know, park research that we've done different things. And, and then all of a sudden now it's like, you can do you can do your own uh, instructional motion, or you, I mean, you can do a residence petition. I mean, I, I don't understand how that just changed. Uh, Madam Chair, can I just add a quick, quick thought on this to make this all simpler? You may. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea to put two articles before town meeting. My having listened to this and appreciating all this work you're doing, a lot of this I do feel is in the spirit of what's been asked for. I think the other document has a lot of good ideas. I understand that not everything could be in there because you just, it, it, if you do all of those things, then it's, it becomes too restrictive. But, but I think this document with some minor adjustments is something that is kind of hits, hits it, it, you know, but the minor adjustments to me from where this is, is you've expanded the tiers seemingly out of nowhere where last, and this, this is the tiers were, were never from us, they were always from, uh, from staff, I think, where it had been 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 and above. Suddenly tonight it's 20 to 25, and then tier two is 25 to 65. And that's, that's to me the biggest change that's in this that just showed up tonight. And to me, it, tier two, it should go back to 20 to 40 and 40 to 60, and that's it that if you cap this at 60, you're gonna solve all, like so many of the problems you guys have been talking about and all the struggles that, that you, you're having over Shoot Street. I, I do think that's a reasonable cap. I don't see how the state is gonna object capping it at 60 units an acre when their law is 20. Um, I don't see how a developer could call that onerous to say the maximum is 60. Um, Postmark is in the 50s and he gave it a fifth story. So you know that would that would be a small haircut off of some of the existing ones it would be in the spirit of what you're saying about shoot and what you said earlier tonight so i think that should be in here and i think you probably need a lot maybe a lot coverage although maybe your setback thing solved that um but um i think an open space minimum of 10 percent. i think with a 10 percent minimum open space defined by heather's uh, civic versus green and capping everything at 60 to me that's I, I think anyway, and others may disagree, gets us 80% of what people have been asking for. Maybe not 100%, but hey, we, we you guys are the professionals and I've listened to all this and I understand why you're doing th things the way you're doing. But those would be the tweaks from where you are that to me obviates the need for a second article or any of this let's say, citizen petition. And you know that's just nonsense to think we're gonna do all that. And it would never fly. And I think you all know that. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate your input. I hope your that was. I hope, I hope it was constructive. I mean, it's really like we're, we're. I feel like we're all working together. I may be wrong, but I, I still don't know why the document is called the slow growth proposal. To me, that's like. Can anybody just explain that? But okay. Nope. Don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We can explain the tier changes later when we get to this, right? Or are we already here? But basically, 20 to 40 is a doubling of the density for the minimal amount of effort, right? And that's, that's why we reduced it because, you know, what what's the incentive to stay down at the 22, 23 range when you, all you have to do is provide this little bit of stuff? You can Fine, but cap, 40. cap tier two at 60 then. I don't know why. No, that no, I, I understand a cap. And I, I think we're yeah. probably heading towards a cap. I'm not sure 60 yep. might be the right number. It might be too low, but but I understand the idea of a cap. But we wanted to make the the incentives, um, I don't want to say the, the word is painful, but wanted more effort for more density. Kick in at a lower density. I'm sorry. Yeah, kick in at a lower density. Good. Well, well said. If they really want that higher density, they need to make more effort to provide some of these things.
Should I go back up or should we talk about the tears? We should talk about the tears. It's top of everybody's mind. So I didn't, I didn't think that we just pull these out of thin air, thin air. I think we talked about these for a long time last time. I mean, it was pretty late in the night, but, um, and the, the, the ranges were also explicitly discussed at the meeting last time. Um, Andrew and I did, did when we were working on it the next day, we were like, oh, did we really have a range this big? And so that's an open question. Like, was this meant to be a range this big or did you want another tier in here? And, you know, I apologize, this document isn't 100% ready for tonight's meeting, but, you know, we did, we did have some open questions um, for discussion tonight. So. That does seem like a big range right there. Yep. But if we made this, if we made this 26 to the 40 and then made the next one 40 to 65, then I think we're all set, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm remembering now because it was late. We were really, we wanted to put downward pressure on that first tier. And I am kind of remembering, wondering, like, oh, did we just make that second tier really big? Which I guess we did. Yep. Oh, we just transpose the number that should be 46. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think this is good though, 26 to 40 and then the 40 to 60 or 65, we can agree on something there. Yep. But you know, if you look at um, the Woburn Street building, its density is in the 60s, is that what it is? The six apartment. 63. Right, so, so that's not an unreasonable building for that location. Right. It has some quirky site features, but overall, the density of that, that number doesn't mean as much as the mass and the number of units. And the highest densities that we have are a little over 78 for Ace Flat, 75 for Rise, and 69 for 30 Haven. Yeah, I think, I think this is reasonable. Yep. Did you want to have a tier for over 65 or did you want to have tier? Because I remember when you talked about these last time, um, they were, they escalated like for over 65, you're contemplating that they would be harder things and they would escalate a lot. Um, and so I just, I'm trying to figure, do we want three tiers or four tiers and have one that's an over 65 tier? Given that those buildings you just listed are in the seventies, I don't see why we would need to. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think I thought that we came back last time. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're John, saying. John, you're breaking up. There you go. Sorry, my other one ran out of battery. Go ahead. Um, I thought we came. I thought we um, came to an absolute number, whether it's 65 or 60 or 68. I, I I don't recall, but I didn't think we left it open. Um, it, I thought it was below 70, and that we just absolute like that's, that's the it. top. We had it. We went, last time we had it as like 80 over 80, 80 and over, and you had us get rid of that one entirely. Yep. Right that you didn't put a cap, like you you had us put this at over 65. So it would contemplate anything that was 65 and above. Um, and then and then we made the requirements like yeah. much harder maybe to achieve, right? Yep. So now I'm just wondering if that's the intent, if we have it 41 to 65, are these requirements meant to be extremely hard to achieve? Not extremely hard, but they're they take some effort. still doable. I'm not characterizing anything right anymore. So, because I'm the <laughs> yeah. one that put slow growth on that proposal, I'll take full credit for that. So, I know, and I don't Sorry, think it everybody. was meant to be derogatory. So, no. I don't think anybody mm -hmm. should get hung up on what we call something. You want to call it omega four? Yeah, Let's call it that. right. I mean, part part of the thing on the slow slow growth is that you know if if we do the reality is right if we do approve something that has a lot of limitations. It will slow growth, um, I, and that's fine if that's right. If that's what town meeting wants, right? And, and, and it'll slow growth because that's a signal to developers that, that you know that Reading is is you know 
not it's as gonna be welcoming. Hard. It, yeah, it's going to be a harder slog oh, to get wow. through the the process. Um, and so, um, and so that will inherently just slow slow down the the process. And so, it's not a yeah, definitely not meant to be a a derogatory or neg negative thing. Just like sort of that is what will that will be the repercussion. Yep. I think we're okay with the cap. You know, we ask for input from the community. Those that chose to speak up have been indicating something like this. So we should take that as a cue that the other voices can speak up at town meeting, I guess, if they if they object. Okay. So just three tiers and these are the way you want them broken out. Yes. Okay. And I guess like this isn't like a super hard cap like if somebody came in at 66 we could still like negotiate around that or does this function as like a hard and fast rule but could someone still get a waiver from our waivers yes you can right you can you can get a waiver still right yep well remember the other thing here is that the unit count we talk about the unit count like it 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 I don't want to say, it does mean something but right just like we had we just had that conversation with um with the civil engineer from on shoot street where it's like oh well they can play the games is keep the building the the mass of the building big um and add bigger units and you know put a Put a three bedroom in there instead of two two bedrooms so if, mm -hmm. right if if they're really katrina right I, the reason why i'm saying this right if they're right at that edge of 66 versus 65 they're just going to put a bigger unit in there and and you know sell it for more and and come it and have it down at 65 which probably works better um because two one bigger unit is probably requires less parking and no less... What, we, what we should do if we're going to do that is that any anything over a two bedroom requires a two two parking spaces per unit yep oh that's a good point right, we yes. should do that yes so that'll stop them from playing that game he, he made yeah. a good point though you know we didn't want bigger units we wanted a smaller building well and it's true i mean when you look at it so you know postmark has a nice has a density of 52, you know, right? They've probably got bigger units in there. I wasn't here when that one was being reviewed. I will say, I because uh, it's worth noting, uh, there were like two members of the public that came to that public meeting for Postmark. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I was not one of them. There, there were when when the historic component was discussed there were more but the the actual when we get down to the nitty-gritty that was one of the first no one no yep right um, i'm not am i making that no, up? no, no we, were we were surprised because right. um gold street drew so much yeah and i guess overall it's like I, i'm just kind of agreeing that we are i think we are it, it right to be focused on the units per acre but if it's a building full of one bedroom units you're going to have more you're going to have more in there um so the the density alone isn't going to get us always smaller buildings it may get us less affordable housing because there'll be bigger units so so overall, this interplay of different things to do for the um, for the different levels of waivers, I think that's good that we have the options. Julie, continue, please. We're getting really close to the, well, it's the bewitching hour. We're not getting close to the end. I don't want to give anyone the wrong idea. We have a lot of big things to talk about. Um, such as the one right in front of you that's highlighted. Um, you all mm -hmm. talked about wanting to do payment in lieu. So um, payment in lieu of providing open space. So uh, the initial feedback I got from DHCD in October when I mentioned the idea to them was that it, it would probably be fine to do 
we need to be clear about what it is we're requiring for open space and then clear about what how we would calculate the payment. I talked to town council today. Town council also said totally fine. Lots of towns do that in some for something, right? Affordable housing, um, you know, it's all different things, right? Okay. Um, and suggested that the payment actually really should be tied to the open space requirement. So, cause I talked to town council about like a couple different options. One option we heard from the residents was tying it to like the per unit above the number of units equal to 20 units per acre. Um, and then another way of doing it, which would be tying it directly to like the square footage of open space that's being offset by the payment. Um, town council suggested we need to tie it to the open space. Um, so, you know, Andrew and I looked at some different ideas, different ways of like figuring out what that calculation should be. Um, we provided a document to you. I don't know if you want me to show it or not. Um, and we don't know if it's the right way to do it, but basically what we did is we looked at some of the properties that have recently um, been redeveloped that we could, that we know like how much they were sold for. Um, we divided it by the square footage and just figured out what the cost per square foot was like not in, not including any of the other factors that matter when land is valued right but um and the, we just looked at how that's changed that it was interesting to see like how it's changed over time um maybe i put it right here in the document are you all looking at it on the screen yep okay i realized i just had all of you and blocking it on my screen so i can't see it but yes yeah, so it's right here so then what we did is we just like took the average of that as a starting point, like it, we put it at around $75, um, $75 per square foot. And then we just figured like, like some examples of what would that look like? Like if you, if you figured out what the requirement for open space would be based on what we have written here, right? And if they want to offset it with, with the payment, like what would that payment look like at $75 per square foot? Um, I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but it's like one way to think about it. And then you could, um, another way to think about it would be to have just like different tiers of like, it was suggested to me, um, like a project's like estimated cost of construction. That's how their building permit is calculated, right? So um, have different different categories of estimated cost of construction. So if it's in one category, one range, there would be like a certain flat payment if it's in another range, it'd be an, another, like a higher flat payment or whatever. Um, and that would be something that they could pay. We wouldn't necessarily know it at the time of CPDC, but we would collect it when they pay their building permit fee. Um, so there's just some different ways to think about it. And town council is um, looking for examples and, and will help with crafting this language um, and reviewing it and just making sure we get it. And then also figuring out like, because another piece of this is that if we do this, we need to set up some sort of fund, right? right. Town meeting needs to establish a fund because mm -hmm. um, we don't, don't currently have like an open space fund. Right. Um, there are other like potentially related funds we could use like a conservation fund. Um, but so they're looking into that side of it for us to try to figure out the best way to do that. And also to make sure that the strings attached to that fund and the purpose of using fund money from that fund um isn't too narrow that like like if it's just land acquisition and there's never anything we can buy like we never use it um and and who's we right doesn't necessarily mean it would be me or you guys or you know we'd have to figure that out um it needs to be broad enough to include things like you know creation or maintenance of a trail or other types of things that you would want to be able to or whomever controls the fund would want to be able to use the money for so there's just all those moving parts that they're trying to help with. right sounds so, good i don't um, think i like the idea of using the construction cost if we're not going to know what it is until they pay their permit because how do we decide on whether they're giving us um, sufficient money while we're approving the site plan right mm. so Okay, but you have some more details to work out there, right? Um, I wanted to get feedback from y'all on what you think. So you're saying what's right. written right here, 15,000 per unit, it, this, this can't be used. We need something that's tied to open space. Right, directly tied to the open space that's being offset by the payment. Um,
Well, number one, 20 square feet for each unit per acre in excess of 20. 20 square feet is costing at the maximum uh, $250, the 120, 122 per square foot. So what are you building at $122 a square foot? Um, I'm going through and reading 25 Haven Street was purchased for $2.25 million in 2020 for $122 per square foot. Oh, I'm sorry. Just the land acquisition. Yeah. Just the land acquisition. All right. Yeah. So, the 79, the, well, number one, the 20 square feet per unit is a little, if they put in 20 units, that's 400 square feet. Do you want to see the chart that we made? Um, that might help. Let me just find it. It's called Payment and Lieu Outcomes, and I'll make it bigger so you can all see it. Can you see it? Am I screen sharing it? Not yet. No? Okay. Mm -mm. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, okay. Can you all see that? Yes. So this is what we we just, we hadn't spoken to town council yet. So we we just played out like what what the resident proposal would look like for the pro projects that were already approved, right? So if they had like, just, I'll just walk through this. So like at a buy right density of 20 units per acre, they would get 15 rounded to 16 units. The project actually has um, per 30 Haven actually is 53. So that's an excess of 37 units. So if we were basing it on a per unit over buy right unit count, $15,000 per, that would be that like 30 Haven would have had to pay $555,000 to the town. Um, and that's how we just figured that out for all these projects. Um, and then if we did it by um, $75 per square foot of required open space, right? So um, the density of the project rounded to 70 is an excess of 50, right? Because the by right density is 20, so it's excess of 50. Um, and if it's a 20 square foot per, uh, 20 square foot feet of open space for each excess, right? That's a thousand square feet of open space for that, for 30 Haven. And then that would result in the $75,000 payment. That's way too um, low for that project, right? Yeah. So we could start increasing the, the square footage dollars on this side, or you can look at the, other table that 555 might be a little high but it's probably closer to the 500,000 than it is to 75,000 I mean, a couple $250,000 for a project like that for open space probably pushing it And the thing that's on my mind is it's it, it, it's interesting that the angle that you took to figure out is, this is very helpful helpful to figure out the cost per square foot of purchasing the property and, and putting it in the context of if you were to kind of purchase and create open space on any of those properties that were bought there would be kind of like redevelopment toward green space right mm -hmm. there still mm -hmm. it, it, there still is there's still cost involved in creating the green space um so you know on the fly what does that mean but i think i i tend to agree that kind of instinctively the right place to end up is toward those higher numbers and it's justifiable when you start to account for what it would what it actually takes to create the green space and those are costs that um, those are costs that the developers are saving too, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they were to take a piece of the property and turn it into green space, there's still that's that's there's still a cost to that as part of the overall project. Yep. Where'd the 15k come from? Uh, I think it came from Dave, Sarah, and Mary Ellen. Do 
you well, I, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Katrina. Um, I know we don't have too much time for more like fact finding, but do we have any like comparable town um, fee in lieu programs where we know how they set their price? Um, we don't. We don't really. Um, there's. So there are two examples I can give. One is the Conservation Commission's tree replacement policy. They have like a one-to-one -one tree replacement within the wetland buffer. Um, and, or, or uh, I think there's three options and I don't remember what the third one is, but one is you plant the tree. One is that you pay into a fund. Um, and that's, I think that's, I forget, I don't know how they make that calculation, but it's based on what trees cost and different species and stuff like that. So it's it's something that could be easily researched and figured out. Um, and then there was a project, the Artist Senior Living Project down the street, down Main Street, um, in lieu of providing affordable beds um, in, their pro in, their, in their memory care facility, they agreed to make a payment to the town. That was a $35,000 over each of five years. And that was negotiated by the select board and the Reading Housing Authority Board after the CPDC process was done. Um, and I don't know the details of how that number was arrived at. Um, so $35,000 times five was the total amount um, that they ended up having to pay. And it, it doesn't, all I've heard I and mean, it's not the affordable housing trust fund's not a great example necessarily to follow because it has two masters. It's really hard to get money out. Um, and and I don't know what the negotiations were like to put the money in. So that's all I can. Uh, and I didn't hear it. Like I don't, when, when we talked to town council about it today with the other staff on the call, there weren't any other things that came up as, as examples to follow, like from Reading. They're looking to see like what other towns do. I think Hopkinton has like a uh, payment in lieu of affordable housing provision. Um, Concord has it in their subdivision regulations actually, but it's like it's negotiated, it's negotiated like out after the fact, it's not really clear like what the payment is. It's something like some very vague language. Um, it, it, and that's in lieu of actually a developer providing a parcel for the town to buy from them. Um, there's like a few different choices that developers can follow. So um, yeah, more more research needed, definitely. We just didn't have a lot of time yep. between so, now and two weeks ago. So Julie, I think, right, I think part of the discussion here on what this price is, is whether the, what the goal is here. Is the goal, right, is the goal to set the price um, so that it's, comparable to you know what it, it it would cost like right or or be a little bit on the steep side from their opportunity cost so that you know it, it's almost a no well maybe not a no-brainer but right more likely than not they would um right they would pay the money in lieu or you know more likely than not they would um figure out a way to develop it because the payment in lieu is so so steep and it, right. And so, right, you could do it two different ways, like sort of inching around that, that what it's really what it's really worth. The thing when I look at this, right, and I'm thinking I, I'm looking at this, uh, the postmark, right, is, you know, where you have um, required open space there of 640 square feet. That is uh, that's two parking spaces, right? Parking space, 320 square feet. So. Um, you know, a parking space is, in this is a way that I'm sort of trying to think about it, a, a parking space, a, a cost for a developer is, you know, about $50,000, um, right? So they, right there, what are they going to do, right? They would much rather pay $48,000 to pay off their open space requirement because, um, you know, because they're really going to rather have the, the two spaces and that, mm -hmm. that paying that off is cheap. Right. Um, right. They're, they're, th that's a 
that's a cheap way to get that that space back um, to do to do something else. Um, so, and then the uh, but then the other thing that we need to think about is right for every square foot for every square foot of open space, you are taking away um, uh, four square feet of opportunity um, uh, development space. Yep. Right, and so if we start to think about like, okay, what's their, what's the opportunity cost of them doing open space instead of instead of something else? That's right, that's money, um, and so it's sort of four times that amount. Um, so to me, all that said is, I think that the cost would equal somewhere around you know two hundred thousand for three hundred twenty square feet. Um, which is six hundred and twenty five dollars a square foot. Yeah, right. And then that that's about right where they they really need to make that choice of like, is it easier to pay off or is it easier to do the site to, to do the 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 stuff on site because I, I I think right the whole point of this is not just to get money from them um, the point is to actually develop with with um, you know with um, some open space so the number has to be high enough so that they really think about doing that and work that into their development plan right and it may be a little too late at night to be thinking about this. Yeah. That's no, the way that I'm right. thinking about it. You're right. That 75 has to be higher because when you look at that 15,000 column, yep. those numbers would do two things. It would drive them to provide the open space so they don't have to pay it, but it might drive them to lower their unit count so they don't have to pay as much if they if they know they're going to end up paying it. They have and to balance it all out. And worst case, you know, the the second goal would be to actually build up a fund um, to in an area that is does not have much park space. The town could maybe buy something and 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 redevelop it for part as green, which is not a bad outcome either. Right? It's not a bad outcome, yeah. right? That also and, fits with much of what we heard in all these workshops and everything. And and, and might get better quality open space than what they're able to provide, but I, you know, you don't know how that until that plays out. Yeah. <clears throat> right. This is useful. Um, Ask David how they came up with the 15,000 quickly. Yeah. David Talbot, you still there? Uh, yes, I am. Um, I'd like to say I have a good answer <laughs> for you there, um, but I don't think I do have a good answer for you. I was just actually searching around to see if See if I could find some some numbers to give you. Um, I I think we just kind of thought, okay, what would be a reasonable number for somebody getting thirty extra units or ten extra units and one hundred and fifty grand didn't seem like a whole lot considering the market value of, of them. It was really a, a kind of a armchair. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I just wanted to know if it was based on anything. I mean, I'm, I'll keep I'm searching, but you need it right now. But... No, no, that's fine. I, you know, I'm just wondering if twelve twelve k is the number to bring that down just a little bit. Sure. But the 75 is too low if we're going to use that side. If you want to use both yeah. of these, you'll have to adjust that one. Right. Well, so it does need to be tied to the open space in some way. So the 75, like if you want to get closer to, um, you know, the totals over here, the 75 will need to go up significantly. Right, the 75. Yeah, yeah. so you're saying that based on your, your discussion with town council, we need to use the formula that's on the right hand side, right. even though those numbers might not be the right numbers. Right. And then the other aspect of this also that that I think, um, let me just, well, I guess I don't need to change, but the document, but um, like 20 is 20 square feet um, per excess um, density. Is that the right? number i mean like i know last time we talked a lot about like not under estimating what we could get um and we had it at 10 and then we bumped to 20. i don't think we ever settled on whether that's the right number to start from 
Um, I will go back to that document. Well, here's the thing. Here's right. Let's look at postmark, and I, I'm going to use my continue to use my um, parking space analogy because we all know how big those are, right? So under 20, you get two parking spaces, which I think is probably two spaces worth of open space. And and um, I'm going to guess that they have that. Forget about the courtyard, right? It, because if mm -hmm. we say we say that doesn't count, um, but they do have that space we were just talking about where they're putting the sign in front right. of the building, right? That's that's about that's, that's two parking spaces. That's two parking spaces. <laughs> you got um, it. You know, like that's I don't think that's what that's the intent here, right? I mean, but that's 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 an unusual building too, right? Because they didn't have any choice, right, in the front. Right. They no that was already that was pre existing. Um right. and and maybe in a different context that would be okay. Right. If that was all at grade, maybe that that is a good space. I don't know. I'm just trying to set that perspective. To me, that doesn't seem like very much space. Um, yeah, I'm really glad you brought us back to that because I had, had glanced over that again this time, and it also doesn't seem like very much space to me. Um, I don't know if it's a doubling of that at least. Okay. And then you can I mean if you increase the space, then you can increase the factor a little less. Right. That's what so I was thinking. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um the other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention, I don't know if this is like a monkey wrench, but or whatever. But I don't and I don't know how familiar you all are with Elm Park downtown. Do you know Elm Park? It's right by Washington Street. It's that little like triangular piece of land. Is that like across house. from the Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah. And it's like kitty corner to the 128 tire property. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually the green space there is actually 4,000 square feet. So just wrap your minds around that. I don't know if that's, maybe you all knew that. And that's intuitive to you, but it wasn't to me. But I thought it would be helpful to like just try to visualize what some of these these sizes really mean. Next time you drive by, take a look at that. I suggest that you actually pay attention since that's the most dangerous intersection in town. <laughs> Never mind. <yeah. laughs> Never mind. It is. It's funny that one location came up twice today, right? Yep. Yeah. Anybody want to raise their hand who got hit? Right there? <laughs> Here. Mine was somewhere Please else. Stop and... <laughs> Only stop and look if you're benefiting from that public parking there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I don't want to get you all in accidents, but especially if it's late at night when you're driving home. Yep. So what do we want to do? Back to our table. Yep. The, the table. one in the zoning. The one back back to the table. Back, the zoning, back to the right. zoning. Okay. Back to the zoning. Yep. So we need to change this to fifty square feet. Uh wait, where was that? Is that what we were doing? Is this the 20 we're talking about? Um, yeah, and actually I think it's it might be in the other tiers as well, but we can start here and then always just copy it in later to the other areas if it's 50 that you think. Um, do you want me to just show you what that looks like in the, yes. um, in the spreadsheet? I'll just yep. throw that in. Give me a second. So I just put it in this. Um, 
Do you see the spreadsheet on your screen? Yes. So I, I didn't increase the $75 per square foot, but I increased the multiplier to 50 here, like you just talked about. And then um, this is what it results in the math. That's closer to what it needs to be. Yep. Can we see that as a percentage of the lot area? Yeah, let me just add that in, hold on. You mean the, the open space as a percentage of lot area? Sure. Um, uh, but at that, right, there's, they, it's like 100% guaranteed that they'll do payment in lieu. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, I wanted to no see one's the... given up. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you really probably can't even develop that much open space and and fit your parking on a site. So you think this is too much required open space? Well. Like, because we, I guess what you were, I, if I understood what you were saying correctly before, we want to have it right on the cusp. So, and so sometimes we get it and then sometimes we, we get money. What's the resident request for open space? 10%? 15%. Not, oh, no, what is it? Lot coverage of 85%, right? I, think but I, thought was a, I thought they had asked for a specifically for an open space requirement. I mean that's that's less than ten percent, right? Twenty five hundred out of thirty three thousand. Oh, yeah, it's right column. here. I, I see I, your column there. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't think it is either. I mean, 30 Haven, and this is, it's not really comparing apples to apples because we've changed the definition of open space or clarified it, but uh, on the other chart of what's been approved of the approved 40 r projects, 30 Haven has, is 16% open. So, you know, that's 50, 5,300 acres, you know, 5,300 square feet, and I'm square feet, square feet, right? But that's and that's that's not the green space that I think folks were looking for. But that's surprising that Woburn Street is getting hit so hard. Yeah, it is. Wait, wait. Let me just make sure there's not a mistake in here. I was 4,000 square feet at 50. Oh, because you're, you're doing the excess. Oh, yeah. Right. It's because their density is so high because there's such a little lot. Right. right. Yeah, and something in that just doesn't doesn't really make sense because they I I that's a good one. I think they kind of fit the units into a small lot kind of nicely and it ended up having an, a very high density. Yeah, it's cuz it's based on the density number, which we said just a little while ago, doesn't necessarily dictate size, right? Right. Because the unit sizes could get bigger, the building size. So maybe 50 is too high. 
but then it, see that it, it's just it's an anomaly, right? Can we waive any yeah. of this? Yeah, this can I mean, all be I, waived. I think like anything in the payment, anything in the waiver section can be negotiated as well. Okay, because wow. I think we would look at this and we'd say that seems unreasonable, especially when Haven would be expected to pay. You know, mm -hmm. fifty-three unit building would be expected to pay just a little bit more. Right. I think if you had it as all three were allowed to go towards this requirement, private amenity, civic, and green space, it might not be too much of a stretch. Well, I think Woburn, 18 Woburn would still be right up there because they don't have yeah. much of that. Nope. They have the outside deck though, like which you know, might count as a private amenity, right? Oh, yeah. And but this, this is not a, oh, I see, as a way to getting to the square footage number, but right. they, their requirement wouldn't be any less because the unit count doesn't change. Right. But it all doesn't change the fact that in most of these cases, right, they're gonna they're gonna pay the money yeah. instead of provide the open space. Yep. Yeah, I mean, twenty five hundred, uh, sixteen hundred square feet at Postmark is worth a lot more than one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. Two bedroom. That's a big two bedroom unit. Yeah. The other thing you could do is you could use the same way of getting to this calculation that's used here. So instead of it being excess density, it's excess like units over by a rate. Um, which might, might be more fair. I don't know. Like We have to get to this tonight. We have to um, finish this. So. <sighs> Yeah, kind of. You know, I, th I think we're getting tripped up in tying the required open space to density when density itself isn't necessarily directly related to square footage because density gets mixed up depending on whether or not you're having one or two bedroom units. Right. So, okay, it's late. So I may just be going down the wrong track entirely. So stop me if this isn't making sense, but maybe we go back to, um, I, somebody just said it, what, what was the residence requirement? Maybe we go back to like a 15% requirement for open space and, and untether it to density entirely. And if, it, if we're saying a 15% requirement for open space, 30 Haven, Somehow, I just, I can't remember exactly how I did this, but 30, 30 Haven, if it was 15% required for open space multiplied by the $75 per square foot, that would be $375,000, which starts to feel a little bit more right to me. Say that again, Heather, one more time. Yep. 15%. Mm -hmm of the lot square footage, we should double check this, times, what I just plugged in what you had there, the $75 per square foot, which we may wanna increase, would yield about $375,000. Yeah. Yeah, let's see what that looks like for all those other ones. This is what you mean, Heather? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what was it we just did? 15, we did 15% of the lot area. And I I no. I, okay. I I I am I'm pulling that only from the space of remembering that. I, it was the instructional motion to have only 85% of the lot area covered. And I still think we should probably have something a little bit higher than that $75 per square foot. 
but that I feel like that at least gets the ratio per project a little bit more right on. The citizen proposal was actually 10% open space, although it was 85% maximum lot coverage. I don't know if it matters for this thought experiment, but thank you. Let's pull it up. What's, what's on my mind here is I also don't want to disincentivize, is that even a word, um, smaller units. Um, if we, if we, the direction we're going, basically you're paying less if you have bigger units and your density is lower, right? And density is uh, important. Sorry. Yeah, I think we should increase the parking requirement on bigger units. That'll help yeah, yeah. bring those yeah, down a bit. Too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, right, Nick, what did you just say? I didn't hear you. I said we should change the parking requirements from 125 to 2.0 for units over two bedrooms. Yep. Agree. That's just another control on how they how they mix the units. We we aren't really seeing a lot of three bedrooms anyways. Most of them mm -hmm. are ones and twos. But they're just so easy to turn over, right? A one bedroom is pretty easy to turn over. So for two un for two bedrooms or more, or for more than two bedrooms? More than two bedrooms. Okay. So it doesn't change anything from what we're typically seeing, but, but that three we, bedroom unit. Are we disincentivizing units that could be for like families? You know? No, you because you're gonna have bigger there. units, you'll probably have less of them and you'll have the same site area to put parking in. And they'll need bigger cars. <laughs> yep. Those big SUVs. So what what where do you guys what do you guys want to do? I think these numbers look good. Which ones? The percentage of of uh fifteen percent of the lot area, those are more in line with what they probably should be for a value. Yep. I would recommend you put in the 15% lot area for now and we can tweak it uh, um, at town meeting with a friendly amendment. Yep. I, I'm gonna suggest that maybe, I mean, right, the numbers, if you're thinking the numbers look look right, um, that maybe the alternative is 10% uh, law coverage, but that have the number, the value be greater than that because, um, because right, th this is guaranteed that they'll just pay out. Yeah. If we do that, I can't remember how it's scared, scaled for tier, well, tier three, but we can up it to 15% for tier three. I think this we're all this is all still tier two, right? Oh yeah. Or this is tier three. Never yeah, mind. So um so you're saying have it be 15% of lot area. Yep. I, I had thought we three. were still a tier two, so I actually yeah. am fine with it. That's a good uh, point though. I mean that, that makes a lot more sense now to tier to tier the percentage with the tiers. Right. <laughs> it's more balanced. You, they just have much more resources. You're doing a 65 unit per acre building, you're gonna have more resources typically. So this would be, it's provided on site, um, comprising 15% of the lot area. And then do we want to have it half of which is provided at grade and publicly accessible? Sure. 
Yes. Yeah, sure. Or indirectly, and the payment we're still thinking seventy five. What wait, about what, what about because it? Oh wait. Uh, if we build that number into here, do we have to keep changing it with you know significant inflation, like over every five years or something? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that number is just was just a starting point. I know. I'm just wondering if we yeah. build a number in here, we have to change it whenever we yep. town meeting has to change it. That would be correct. So you want to yeah. say something okay. about a um, we, value just, determined at the beginning of every year by CPDC. Or, or can we just index that to inflation? I don't care. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you it's indexed to that. inflation. And I okay. still feel like $75 might be a little bit low, but I kind of need some help on what might be the right per square footage. Uh, it's not low if we're getting three and a quarter for the okay. first that's example. Great. I think that's pretty good. Okay. At a rate of what, $75 per square foot of offset open space. Index to inflation. good does that go there or does the index to inflation have to be immediately after the 75 dollars oh wait yeah because it's you want to say that the money is indexed to inflation not the open space i put it here index to inflation yeah i see what you're saying or is that maybe that's not the right place either? That's where I would put it. Okay. Or a completely new sentence that said payment is indexed to inflation. The rate would be not the payment. Mm -hmm. I'm just keeping this because I don't want to lose my yep. math here, but I'll delete it. Um, and then in tier two, we would have it be 10% of the lot area. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, I believe that's what was proposed. Yep. Insight comprising 10% mm -hmm. of the lot area. And we, we'll, we'll wordsmith a, a little bit tomorrow um, to make sure it sounds right. Um, and then here it's going to be elevated. Did you guys have any other comments about the tiers? Um, no, I think they're better now. And one thing that we, I'll just go back really quick because we did make a couple adjustments to um, the goals um, or the design objectives, I should call them. And one of them is related to um, just like how we word the parking. So instead of how we had it before, which is like the additional supply of parking or whatever, um, we reworded it to say long-term shared parking agreements or other mechanisms to creatively and efficiently utilize or add to existing parking supply. Um, I think the other ones are the same. And then I added in a clause here because we, when we were doing the math for all these like little charts and trying to figure things out, we realized um, that, well, I, I don't know if I had this last time or not, but that we would want fractions to always round to the next highest integer. And then also when we were looking at like the tiers, we wanted to be clear that like um, if your project's more than the 21 to 25 acres, the thing you choose in here needs to be scaled to your whole project, right? So it's not just the portion of your project that's in this density, it applies to the whole project. So like, yep. um, 
maybe it doesn't specifically relate to any of these, but just like as you go along, so then you're like you're you're applying your 60 unit per acre project to this tier. And so you're counting all of your excess density, not just the portion of it that's within this bracket, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, so we put that up here. Okay. All right. And so just going back to, to the, some of the things we skipped past, I'll go back to where we left off. So I don't miss anything. Um, so did we decide, we, do we want to add any specifics to this open space design section? No, nope, I think we're good. Um, actually, did we want to change the 33% compact space allowance that's in here? I'm okay leaving it because you said it, it's working, right? That's what I've heard. Yeah. I thought we were okay with that third okay. of the bargain. I just wasn't, I, I didn't know if we finalized that discussion or not. So we'll just leave it. Um, okay. There has been a lot of discussion about that at park, but a lot of people not in agreement with that. So do we- I, I am not one of those people, but I'm just letting you know that that was a, has been a continued topic of discussion. Okay. I mean, do you think that it's, do you, do you think if it would, well, I guess it could always be amended at town meeting, or do you think we should lower it out of known concerns? We say up to 33%. So in some pro, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to always grant that much. Yeah. Um, they can request it and then you can, if it, if it, the, the circulation pattern doesn't seem like it's going to work and the turning movements can't be made. You could, yep. you know, like yep. you don't have to give it to them. This is a due requirement. There was previously not, no specification. Right. So we didn't, it wasn't clear. It doesn't say anywhere, but it was just, I, I kept keep track of that data and I just noticed that 33% was basically where CPTC was ending up with a bunch of the projects that were approved in the past in terms of compact spaces. Do you have any insights on that, Katrina, and like what would make sense? I, I, I feel fine with, with a third. I just, with MAPC's website, um, citing one case study goes with a third. But um, yeah, I, I feel fine with that. I would just clarify. Clarify what, which part? Whether or not this was new or, oh, or being uh, added. Yeah, so. Specific reason. It's it's being added in here. Right. It, um, except, right, it's, it's being added, except that has been the working. Right. Uh, yeah, most, no, yeah. Working sort of uh, policy, like uh, um, unwritten policy that, that CPDC has tried to stay with, stick with. No, no greater than 33%. Okay. But I want to correct a statement, Julie. You said we can waive the 33%. That means we can go higher. We can't go, go lower. No, I said where it says up to 33% may be provided. So like if they propose 33% of their garage and you don't think it works, like you can reduce it. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Hmm. That's Make sense to people? Yep. Um, Might need just a little more clarification on that. What do you propose? The CBDC, CBDC may allow up to. Okay, good. This is just wonky now. Yeah. You want a quick update on the minimum lot size 
requirement. Um, I quickly found that about 40 out of 67 lots would not qualify for redevelopment, whether due to frontage, lacking or municipal ownership, or a few are pretty built out. So that leaves about 25 to 30 lots that might fit under the 6,000 square foot minimum. Like would be impacted by it. No, so 40, 40 would not qualify regardless. And that leaves 27 that could be developed under 6,000 square feet. Wait, that's a, a confusing wording. Do you have a chart you can share? Um, I just have a list of ones that might not be developed. So of the 67 that are under 6,000 square feet, only 27 can be developed today. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> so it, we're impacting 27, basically. Correct. Um, do you still think the 6,000 square foot minimum is the right? It's the right way to right way to go. The reasoning here was to try and what uh, have the minimum lot be larger than before. So before it was it was not applicable, like zero basically. Um, and I think one of the reasons for it was to try to encourage projects that have more units, right? So that we can get more projects with an affordable component. Whether 6,000 square feet would be enough to do that, you know, seems maybe unlikely, but um, it's our median lot size in town. We can leave it and have town meeting discuss it. Frankly, from the very beginning of the 40 yard code development, I always thought that small lots would be combined. Right, that there isn't, that's, it's too much effort for most of these small lots to try and develop them. And that somebody would be looking to combine a bunch of lots to get to the number that they wanted. Right, so, and 6,000 yeah. also, um, it, it's, it is hard to, to get a 40 yard project on 6,000 square feet. I mean, there's been a couple instances where it's worked. Um, the 14 Chapin project, that's about a 6,000 square foot lot. They, you know, you all agreed that four units was too much there, so they got a waiver from the state definition of multifamily to be able to provide three. And then the um, Chronicle building is just under 6,000 square feet, and that's on a corner. And then the other one that's small is the 4,000 square foot lot across the street from my office on um, at the entrance to the CVS parking lot, and that's also like a corner, very square lot. So. It's not impossible, but the prod the unit counts aren't aren't very high. But right, but then you know the other things that we added on that we're adding in here, they there's no way that any three of the uh, either of any of those would be developable. Um, right. So, I guess the the point. I guess what why I know I I brought it up because at one point right we we're talking about four thousand I think six thousand because what we we I think we don't want is you know sort of continued all these this like shoehorning uh, in of these tiny little you know um, developments and sort of to to next point sort of if if someone's going to use this you know force the issue that it has to be a bigger lot size so they can accommodate you know site circulation and open space and you know all of this stuff that we that we want and not just you know shoehorning these tiny little developments that don't get us any affordable units mm -hmm. right i mean i so, do think the 30 foot combined setbacks thing here is going to be tricky on a lot of properties and may be rejected by dhcd yep um Okay, 
so we'll go back down to where we left off. Um, I know I mentioned this and then skipped past it, um, but the design, open space design, do you like how this is worded and should we? I, I like what you've done with that. I, um, I've been sitting here thinking about, I have been thinking about whether or not to add similar language with green space and private amenity space. And I feel like, I feel like the definitions above do the trick. Um, I, I realize that there's some imbalance and what kind of language there is then going into the detail around civic space but i can say around green space i feel like if we if we expound on it too much um we may actually get too prescriptive and inadvertently hamstring ourselves that's exactly the challenge we faced when we were trying to figure out what to say yep. um So if you all agree, we'll just leave it to civic space and move on. Yeah. Yep. One more person. Move on. I already heard from you, Pam. I'd like to hear from three. I need a majority. OK, Nick. I thought Heather said yes. Yeah, Heather and Pam. I need one more. Oh, I gave like yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't see your thumbs up, Katrina. Okay, I'm sorry. My bad. I can't see you all on my time. Oh, my apologies. No, it's fine. Oh, oops. All right. Well, whatever. And it is getting late. So, how far are we away from getting this done? Okay. It's getting early. Late was two hours ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you guys are at home. Yeah, but some of right. us have to drive distances tomorrow morning know, or I this know. morning. So the affordable units, whether we can go any lower than 12, I'm still waiting to hear back from DHCV. Um, I think the answer is no, because we looked into it a few years ago. I just couldn't find my information from that conversation. Um, I also asked DHCV for examples of how other communities um, any other mechanisms communities use so their districts don't fall below the minimum required affordability. Um, waiting to see what they say about that. Um, nothing yet. Okay, and um, more from John. Let me see. Under criteria for plan denial, he added some language. I don't know if he's still on the call. I don't believe here. so. Oh, you are. There you are. <laughs> Kudos to you all. It's an incredible uh, effort tonight. I just added this again to uh, to underscore that you are expressly authorized uh, to deny a project if it fails to, in your estimation, fail to integrate with or complement the character of the nearby residential or other buildings. Again, making clear you have that authority. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, like if we reword the language, we'll reword it the same way in all the sections where it's mentioned. Sounds good. Um, all right. And okay, then we're at the waivers, which you guys talked about. I think you got through all of it. Um, so I don't want to miss anything. Excellent. We do want to probably clarify what we want to do about John's language. Um, and I'm going to go up to the one that I think might be most, potentially might be most impactful. All right, so it's this one where it's related to height. That seems very low mm -hmm. for a three-story building.
Well, also, I guess the other, <laughs> right, we have two issues to sort of think through with this. Um, right, his, I know he said he, he, right, the proposal was 150 feet, um, which incorporates, you know, right, as we talked about almost all the, the downtown smart, smart growth area. So this, you know, it, it, without some change, right, this would, this would limit height within the, the entire downtown right. to 33 feet. Again, based on your determination that they haven't adequately addressed the design elements. I, I worry about this limiting mixed use development and ending up with just residential because yep. multifamily is allowed at 33 feet. So why would somebody go through the effort of trying to do mixed use to have us tell them that it doesn't fit? And so. All I have to do is change the design to meet your needs. That's reading awkwardly, by the way, the sentence above it, multifamily residential, I think it's with commercial uses on the ground floor, 45 feet, some, there's some sort of tab missing. You know what I'll do? I'll just... Oh, there's supposed to be bulleted items. I'll just add in that. Uh, we'll figure it out. I, I okay. reformatted That's another fine. section. I'll reformat it's supposed to be a table. Converting yeah. from uh, PDF to Word, tables usually get screwed up a bit. I'll just reformat tomorrow. Okay. The goal of adding this is to ensure the complementary design concept. And we keep that language else where maybe we don't need it in this section. Thirty-three feet seems awfully low. Multifamily residential buildings. I don't think we have any. Yeah, we do. I it's something that we chose to allow. There's some different choices from 40R that we can adopt in the local bylaw. And these are the ones we chose, multifamily or multifamily with commercial. We have a multifamily residential building at 14 Chapin Avenue that was approved and constructed under pursuant to 40R. And this new language would effectively only apply um, to mixed use buildings with commercial on the ground floor because multifamily are already capped at 33 feet. Right. So the, the we, we sort of have, right, we already have an ability to, to you know, if, if something is really not in keeping with the character to, to limit, Right, we do have some some authority there. I guess this is so subjective. Um, I think Heather, you pointed that out. Like you, they don't know until they come out. Like it come forward. Like it's it's at it's at to me it's at too much of the whim of of CBDC and their feeling of what. Um, what complements the character of a nearby residential building. And we have that authority already, but this is sort of really in your face. I would think this, right, I, I would stay away. But mm -hmm. if I started reading this throughout the document, um, and maybe that's, maybe that's fine. Um, yeah, like I said, I I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't bother proposing the right. the mixed use commercial because 
you've got to go through that whole negotiation and all the costs that goes along with it. And as Katrina said, we have this in several other places now elsewhere in the bylaw to signal that it's really important to complement the character of what's nearby. Do you want me to take it out of this location and then I can go up and look at the way it's worded in the other locations? Yep, I agree. I'm gonna go up to the, um, I think I mentioned up above. Oh, maybe not, hold on. Julie, I will back out, but I just wanted, to, if you're looking for the others, it was in 10.5.6. It was in your dim dimensional uh, chart. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, for some reason, I thought they were also up above um, right here. Okay. Yeah, up above is the change in definition of the transitional zone. Right. Let me just go grab that language from above that you guys had talked about. Um, is that under trans? No. Compa will be compatible with nearby. Compatible. Yep. Compatible. Okay. Let me just see if that makes sense down here. Be compatible with yep. the character of nearby residential land. That's better. They seem okay to you, these, these sections. And then, John, were they meant to be part of the footnote? <coughs> part of these footnotes? Like, um, the setbacks would be part of 711, and then the step backs would be part of footnote related to 712? That, it's, that seemed to be, to me, the play. I guess you could put the setback one in uh, footnote one, and but yeah. it, it is only applying in the area where it, where it abuts a residential zone. Right. Or where, uh, well, yes, it, it, where it abuts a residential zone, or if you accept the broadened definition of transitional area. But so I put them both under uh, footnote two. But wherever you think is best, if you if you think it's it's worth keeping. Do you, how do you, how do you feel about this CBDC? Looks fine to me. Uh, I know I've expressed uh, a number of times my hesitancy about um, tying in regulations uh, for one property with the use of an, of an adjacent property. Um, that being said, I, um, I guess I would understand this or sort of wrap my head around this a little bit better if the definition, as Jonathan had proposed, was um, abutting properties and not within 150 feet, um, because I'm not sure the exact connection between the setback and a property that's two properties away. Um, but I do get it. I do understand I, I do understand when it's an, an abutting property. And if we if we go back look at looking at that map, um, 
about half of the properties in the district are still abutting um, uh, uh, residential y use properties. I, I'm I'm still not that comfortable with using that, but uh, um, at least I can wrap my head around it, <laughs> and I I get it, and I'm you know um, if others are comfortable with it, I I I'm, I, I could go along. If others are comfortable with the direct with, abutting, w with the whole notion of of use of in zoning tying what you're allowed to do on your property with what your neighbor happens to be doing with their property, <clears throat> as opposed to setting up things based on zones, as the name implies, not adjacent uses. I think given the realities of um, kind of the differences in what some properties are able to do within our overlay district by the nature of their size and their frontage, some of, and, and we're, we're making it even more restrictive with our changes here. I'm comfortable going with this. And I think, I think John, what I heard you saying is having it tied to directly abutting properties not within 150 feet and if that's what you were saying i can go with i can go for that that is what i was saying so take out the highlighted part but and go back to directly abutting right but that's not and it directly right this there's a difference right from from a Right, I guess the definition is the same, but taken in context of the next recommendation or proposal by Jonathan, right, that transitional transitional area and the abutting has more heft, right? It it carries a little bit more weight than anything that it, it might have said before. Does that make what sense? What do you what do you we're not just going back to, I guess, in this, in the definition, yeah, going back to directly abutting, but right, keeping, but because it's built in below, right, it has some impact. Yes, yes, yeah, right. The other thing that I asked here, I think since we mentioned district edge, I think we need to pull that definition in from the design guidelines as well. Um, mm. Into this bylaw. Good point. We could say it's just mounted in your design guidelines. As part of the definition of transitional area? No, we'd put it above, like under D, but like oh, we, yeah. we mentioned it. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. Term, yep. So probably should be defined here, yes. not just in yep. the design guidelines. So I can add that in. Um, Um, okay. Then the other big thing that we need to talk about is what we're doing with um, one article versus two articles. I think, because I think that we've gone through this. Mike, please chime in if, if I'm missing something we haven't talked about. I mean, how would you which even? One are we look, which one are we looking at right now? Then? This is the this is the CPDC document, the one that has all your your ideas in it, and it includes like your ideas, some of which were modified by ideas from residents, but it doesn't include all of the resident ideas. So, based on some of the changes we made tonight, it gets closer. 
especially oh. with our the way we've handled the open space requirements, even in the lowest tier, right? The tier that starts at tier two, 26 units per acre, we have the 10% requirement. So that's kind of virtually achieving one of the primary requirements from the, the citizens. Agreed, unsolicited comment, sorry. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> Um, did we change the uh, two bedroom unit needs to have, or two bedroom and up needs to have two parking spaces? Did we change that? Greater than two bedroom. Hmm? Greater than two bedroom. Greater, greater, than, two than, two, two, greater than two bedroom. No, I didn't change it. Okay, we need to add that. Does the majority of CPBC agree they want that in this? Yeah, that, that was just my yes. requirement. My yes, request. I'll support that. I'll support that. Yep, me too. I'm just trying to find where we're losing here. I think it's back up. Search for the number. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so tired. Search, yeah. search, search. Wait, it was fine. right there. It's right there. I just go back. I went by it. They're right there. Oh, right here. It's just like yep. in the middle of this yeah. jumble. Yep. Um, <laughs> you just need to put one into bedroom. Oh, yeah. All right. Under residential, after residential units, yep. right? It'll, residential units, parentheses, one and two bedroom, right after the word or, units. Or, or comma. Or it should be two bedroom and below because it could be studios. Oh, okay. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's better. Okay, and then underneath it, you want just repeat it and say, you know, greater than two bedroom. Okay. All right. And you wanted it to be two. Two. Seven. Make it seven. <laughs> it solves all the problems. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, those big SUVs. There'll be a lot of waivers on that one. Yeah, I think that's good. Okay. Single, uh, singular unit at the end. Yep, thanks. Um, all right, guys. Is there any, anything else? No, you were asking about one or two moat. Uh, warrant yeah. articles i just don't know how you would manage that would you do one are they running in parallel to vote on them uh, people get confused when you show them track changes i can't imagine how you yeah have two scrolling two warrants town meeting had an experience with um kind of an option a and option b warrant article at the last town meeting and it was uh very confusing Right. I mean, like, in what order do you take it? It's like, okay, so do I not vote for this one because I'm holding out hope for the second one? And I, I guess if, if we're hearing tonight that we've covered the intention, or at least the bulk of the intention in the instructional motions, I would really recommend going with one single warrant article. Go with a single, and then if there's something that's missing, it can be proposed as an amendment. But you're going to have to be ready to defend or... Um, accept that. Yeah. And by you, you mean you. Well, I, I'm not a town meeting member anymore. The last I time I went, we spent two days talking about where you could put beehives. So, well, you know, we care. all have to run again as well. So it could be that neither Tony nor I are town meeting members come April either. <laughs> well, we'll figure so it I, out. I, I do think pr as part of, if that's the way we go, as part of the um, you know, discussion of this being very deliberate about um, about the uh, components of the instructional motions and why you know what our discussion was and and why we included it or did not include it or how we amended it um, to get you know to get to where we were um, so that it's clear that that those things were addressed in sort of this whole process. Yeah, and kind of deeply deliberated. And as long as we're on it now, I'd say, you know, being prepared with some information to share with town meeting that was really useful to us, like 
the percent open area, the percent lot coverage of existing uh, of, of the projects to date, like what we gleaned from comparing what's happened with the projects to date with the instructional motions and how we address the instructional motions and more in the proposed bylaw update. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know, like I, I noticed that not all of our residents are here with us still. I mean, it's almost 1.30, but yep. I... I guess I would wonder from Dave if he thinks that this bylaw gets there. Uh, my you... answer is, in a word, yes. I mean, I, I got to read it all fresh, but yeah, I mean, what Heather said makes perfect sense to me. And and yep. put this up, I don't, yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah, Dave, I think we all need to read it with, fre with <laughs> exactly. fresh eyes. I mean... Right, right. So, and not, putting you in a in a corner there um no, on no. how you would vote but right I, I i think the concern or i'll say i'll speak for myself the concern is that uh, um you know through this whole process we have heard some of the same things that i i know that i thought that we had discussed and and sort of walked through um both internally and and externally with it the, and then they come back up again so my concern is that it you know e even through all this that we'll get those same comments again um right. so maybe we all you know go, so, go have lunch you know between now and then and yeah no and it's, it's not t directed at you david no, no, i'm no. just saying you know they're like they just keep coming up and i know what you mean and and sometimes i i thought we sort of rash like walked through them all and I, I, sometimes it's good to just have a, you know, sort of a yes or no, and maybe we'll get there with through through some amendments to this. So we'll see. Right, town meetings always fun. <laughs> fun as this. Oh dear. Um, I did want to say that um, I spoke with town council today, and she recommended that you keep this hearing open until your next meeting so she can spend the next week looking at what you've done and, and let you let me know if there's any like major things that she thinks need to change so that your hearing is still open and if needed you can have a little time on the seventh to like make small adjustments or big adjustments like normally we would close the hearing and she'd review it because we wouldn't be worried there might be big things but with this bylaw and there's so much like so many unknowns and so many moving parts and so many new things that you're talking about. And um, she just felt like keeping it open so she can at least give it a glance this next week would be smart. Okay. So can I make a motion? So Please. Feb uh, February 7th at- um, Say at least 9.30. Oh gosh. Yeah. What? I actually had 10 written down. Yeah, oh exactly. no, 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 we, that's too late. Yeah, yeah, but the point is that there shouldn't be anything to do, right? Like, right. Ho hopefully, right. there's nothing. This is just, this is just kind of can be any corrections that need to be made, right? Right. Just like yeah, because she's yeah, it's just this is a big this is a big undertaking, as y'all know. So mm -hmm. want to make sure we don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But if we end early, if it's on, we have to wait till the time arrives. Right. Oh yeah. Do it. Do nine thirty. Yeah, so nine thirty. Nine thirty. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. So I move that we continue the public that. hearing on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment for Section Ten Point Five Downtown Smart Growth District Forty R Overlay to February seventh at nine thirty p.m. Second. Second. All in favor? Got it. Beautiful. All right. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks. We have to adjourn. Oh yeah, move yes. to motion. <laughs> motion. Move to adjourn. Second. See ya. Thanks all. Sleep well. All, all right. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Come Thank in you. Come in late tomorrow. Yes. Bye. <laughs> Eight o'clock. <laughs>